This is the start to the day, folks. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'd like to call the me of the justices. Honestly, we usually don't have these things happen. I would like to call the meeting of the Legislative Commission's Budget Subcommittee to order. Good morning to everyone who is with us in the committee room as well as those attending in Las Vegas. I am Senator Don Darrow Loop and I will be chairing this meeting today. Will the committee secretary please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson? Present. Assemblywoman Bacchus? Present. Assemblywoman Brown May? Here. Assemblywoman Dickman? Here. Assemblywoman Gorlow? Assemblyman Hafen? Here. Assemblywoman Hadagi? Here. Assemblywoman Kasama? Here. Assemblyman Miller? Assemblyman O'Neill? Here. Assemblywoman Peters? Assemblyman Watts? Here. Assemblyman Yeager? Here. Senator Canizaro? Here. Senator Gokachia? Here. Senator Harris? Here. Senator Neal? Here. Senator Wynn? Senator Sievers Gansert? Here. Senator Titus? Vice Chair Monroe Moreno. Here. Chair Dondaro Loop. Here. Thank you very much. And please mark those uh, present when they arrive. Thank you very much. So before we move into today's agenda, I would like to remind all the committee members and members of the public to turn off any electronic office uh, devices you have for those who will be providing testimony today. Please remember to state your name for the record and spell this when you are doing so before speaking. And if you have a business card, please leave that with the secretary. Um, this helps our secretaries to transcribe the meeting. Let's move on to agenda item two, which is public comment. This is the first period of public comment today. There will be another public comment period at the end of today's meeting. Due to time considerations, each person providing public comment will be limited to not more than two minutes. Um, please remember to state your name. To call in to provide testimony during the public comment, please dial 669-900-6833. When prompted to provide the meeting ID, please enter 862-2027-5988 and then press pound. When prompted for the participant ID, just press pound. The call-in information is also provided on the agendas uh, for today's meeting. I'll begin with public comment here in Carson City. Is there anyone who would like to give public comment? Seeing none, I will go to Las Vegas. Unless somebody is behind the poll, I do not see anyone. So we will go to uh, the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. Good morning, Chair. The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers wishing to participate at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So with that being said, we will go to agenda item three. And this today will be the hearing budget presentations for the Judicial Branch, Department of Public Safety, Department of Motor Vehicles, Department of Transportation, and the Department of Corrections. We will try and follow the start times listed on the agenda, but I do plan on taking a lunch break between agenda items five and six. So first up, we have the Judicial Branch, Chief Justice Stiglitz and her team. So please come forward and begin your presentation when you're ready. And welcome Justice Lee for joining us today. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair Dondero Loop, Chair Monroe Moreno. Uh, Justice, would you make sure you push your button and bring your mic down so that we can hear you? It just, the whole thing, there we go. First rodeo. I, it's way okay. All right. We fuss with it every time we come in. All right. Well, good morning, uh, Chair Dondero Loop, Chair Mamoro Moreno, and esteemed members of this joint committee. My name is Lydia Stiglitz, and I serve as a justice on the Supreme Court of Nevada. With me this morning is Catherine Stocks, our court administrator, John McCormick, an assistant court administrator, Todd Myler, our manager of budgets, Emily Kuhlman, she's our director of HR, and Paul Embley, he's our CIO. We're honored to appear before you today to provide a high-level overview of the court's legislative priorities. The first of which is our, as we've termed, our super priority, and that's SB 58. 
Senate Bill 58 is a package of reforms to the court's budgeting process to ensure sustainable, predictable funding to support the judiciary. This bill provides efficiency, accountability, and promotes constitutional independence for the judicial branch. When Nevada was still a very small state, we had a correspondingly small administrative office of the courts. As the state's population continues to increase, Nevada's decentralized model for its court system has seen corresponding increases in demands for services. This proposed new model will help the administrative office of the courts provide critical support to our lower courts. Further, while the AOC may have needed more direct support back at inception, both the branch and the state have grown, and now is the right time for the courts to step up to a more active administration of its own budgets and branch. It's only been since the early 1970s that the court has been included in the unclassified pay bill, which conflicts with current statute. Our reality is that the unclassified positions at the Supreme Court no longer accurately reflect the work that is actually being performed here at the Supreme Court. Our proposed budget and classification system does. We're seeking flexibility to execute our constitutional responsibilities with SB 58, not autonomy. We expect the legislature to continue to exercise its constitutional responsibilities to review and authorize the expenditure of funds. We believe that SB 58 strikes this balance. SB 58 will allow us to manage our own budgets while maintaining accountability to and transparency with the legislature. In other words, we fully recognize and welcome continued legislative oversight to ensure that our budget goals are in alignment with those of the legislature and the state at large. Specifically, SB 58 has four primary components. It creates the Judicial Fund, which is modeled after the Legislative Fund, which has been used successfully by the Legislative Council Bureau for some time. It expands on precedent set during the 2020 special and 81st sessions providing non-reversion to the judiciary to stabilize funding uncertainties, giving us the resources and flexibility needed to adapt to certain but unpredictable change. It amends the NRS to create holding and emergency accounts. Reducing reliance on administrative assessment revenue from traffic citations will help the court have more predictable, sustainable budgets. The bill unties specific portions of administrative assessment revenue to particular purposes, allowing the courts to use this funding flexibly to accomplish its goals. The reforms embedded in SB 58 have a very close to net neutral fiscal impact on the general fund. Finally, and unrelated to the goals we're seeking in SB 58, we have two standalone bills, AB 15 and AB 16. These bills would implement COLAs for district court and appellate court judges respectively. They're meritorious bills that deserve serious consideration by this body. Um, with that, we'll start our slide presentation. Uh, as the court's aware, um, or the court, pardon me, as you're aware, <laughs> the, the judicial branch is, is nested in the Constitution. Our separation of powers is captured in Article 3, Section 1 of the Nevada Constitution. And Article 6, Section 1 of the Nevada Constitution talks about the judicial powers of the Nevada Supreme Court. The Supreme Court duties are to administer the Nevada judicial system decide or assign the Court of Appeals, civil and criminal cases appealed from district courts, exercise extraordinary writ review, different writs, appellate review for judicial discipline, licensure and discipline of lawyers. And the Court of Appeals duties you know, are, are similar. The Supreme Court duties of the state of Nevada are very different than some of our national partners that have Supreme Courts. Because as this body is mostly aware, we don't exercise cert in the same way. If it's filed, we hear it. And therefore, where a body like the United States Supreme Court might select out of hundreds of thousands of cases, 85 a year, if 3,000 cases are filed with the Nevada Supreme Court, the Nevada Supreme Court hears 3,000 cases. And you'll see on the next slide, um, cases filed and disposed. Uh, starting with FY21, new cases filed, 1,860. You'll see that number increasing. It de decreased a bit during COVID. And there's still certainly some uncertainty about what's going to happen when the courts are running at, at, at full piston, how those numbers are going to increase over time. So cases pending, 1,046, FY21, 1,036 in the Supreme Court. And just to note, cases pending means cases filed. Those are not cases ready for decision. Cases ready for decision are cases that have been fully briefed by the parties and, and are on a justice's desk ready to go. 
that number is substantially less than the cases pending. With that, I want to turn to Judicial Branch Revenue and turn that over to Todd Myler, our Manager of Budgets. Thank you, Chief Justice. My name is Todd Myler, uh, Chief uh, Manager of Budgets for the Judicial Branch. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and testify before you regarding our budget submittal. This uh, budget uh, contains total funding of $169 million. Uh, that is an increase over what we've had in the past. I believe our last biennial budget came in around $120 million. Uh, so it is an increase. Um, however, uh, as the chief mentioned, um, we have grown as a state over time, and it is time for the judicial branch to uh, do what is needed to provide, uh, to continue to administer justice to all Nevadans, and that's why this increase is here. Um, it's broken down, uh, there's a breakdown there of uh, the general fund. You'll see uh, a very large chunk of the uh, general fund, uh, not quite half, is, is related to judicial elected official salaries. So that isn't really the court's operating budget. That is uh, only for uh, the Supreme Court justices, the Court of Appeals judges, and the district judges is that number there. Um, the rest of the budget, uh, the rest of the line items that are listed in that table are what we would consider the operating budget for the court to do those things that we need to do um, to have the staff necessary to help the court with its duties. Um, and then there's a, a small breakdown um, uh, there also showing what type of decision units constitute that general fund appropriation. Um, general fund is about $126 million. Um, in the last biennium, we were around 90. So again, it, it is an increase, but uh, back to what the chief said, we have grown and it's time to, to do what we need to do. The, um, under the constitutional authority uh, that the judicial branch has, there are four budget accounts that uh, fall under that. Uh, one would be, as I mentioned, the judicial elected officials. Contains 100 elected officials there, seven justices, three court of appeals judges, and 90 district judges. Um, below that, obviously, the Supreme Court budget has 85 current full-time positions. We're asking for four new ones. Uh, the Court of Appeals has 22 full-time positions. Uh, that one is remaining uh, static. And the Senior Judge Program also has one full-time position, but also at the time of this writing had 29 senior judges. I think we're actually over 30 now. But um, Additionally, we have statutory authority, uh, and that is the number of budget accounts that we have. The Administrative Office of the Courts has 32 uh, current positions, we're asking for an increase of 15 new positions, uh, 10 of which we'll get to our auditors. We'll talk about that a little bit later and why that's important. Um, one thing you'll notice in, in our budget submittal is that we are also asking to combine a number of budget accounts into this one, the Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, and that goes back to what the chief had asked for uh, in, in SB 58, giving the court flexibility to uh, perform all of its duties, and especially the uh, administrative office of the courts. Uh, we believe that the combination of those budget accounts will allow us to be more flexible, allocate staff as needed, um, and the funding as needed. Um, but uh, the other budget accounts listed here, um, You'll see judicial programs and services. That is the only one, with the exception of the specialty courts, that has general fund. That would also be absorbed into uh, the AOC's budget account, which has historically only been funded by administrative assessments, which we'll get to administrative assessments here in a bit. Um, with regard to the specialty courts budget, 1495, uh, there is one full-time position there that is remaining the same. Um, that is funded uh, in this budget request, approximately 75% general fund and 25% uh, by a specialty court assessment, which is tied to NRS 176.0613. Uh, 
there are at the moment regular administrative assessments contained in that budget which we have asked to be removed and i'll get to that here in a little bit as to why um, with that, I'll turn it over to John McCormick to discuss administrative assessments. Uh, thank you, Todd. For the record, uh, John McCormick, I'm the Assistant Court Administrator at the Supreme Court, and I want everybody to sit back and relax, and we'll talk about the history of administrative assessments since 1983. <laughs> In depth, no. <clears throat> uh, seeing many familiar faces here, you've heard probably heard me prattle on about this before, but currently, as Mr. Myler indicated, the Supreme Court receives a significant amount of revenue from administrative assessments, the primary one being that which is contained in 176.059 um, and is levied on misdemeanor and now civil uh, traffic infractions as well, um, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Uh, however, uh, administrative assessments, uh, I think we, we've demonstrated, have been consistently declining. We can go into that a little bit more later on. But that is one of the problems that we're currently confronting, and I think the legislature is where, well aware of the, sort of the precarious nature of administrative assessments um, and the order of collection and, and those type of things. So not belaboring AAs, but uh, we also don't know... Um, what exactly civil traffic, the conversion on January 1st of, of traffic offense, misdemeanor traffic offenses from uh, misdemeanors obviously to civil is going to have on administrative assessments. We don't have enough uh, data. It's been less than a month on that. So we are currently compiling that and look to be able to bring updates on that as we move forward and get, get uh, progressed through the session. But administrative assessments in themselves, you can see here on this chart, uh, were about $30 million at their peak in 2010 and are now approximately half of that at 15 million. So that funding source uh, swings pretty wildly and has been precipitously dropping over the last decade plus. Good morning, I'm Catherine Stocks and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, as far as the budget stabilization piece, which is a, a huge part of our actual request, I came on in 2021 and we completed a statewide strategic planning process. We reached out to the trial courts across the state and being a decentralized judiciary, uh, we asked the courts what it is that they're looking for and what they need. And as Mr. Myler noted earlier, with the growth of Nevada to be a mid-major state now, the AOC itself uh, has remained stagnant in its size and is one of the smallest in the country. And so part of the strategic planning process is over and over we had requests of, well, can the AOC help our trial court that doesn't have resources? We, there are courts that do have plenty of local support. They have the resources they need to provide access to justice in this state. There are also trial courts that are not well funded by their local entities and they do need support. And so part of that iterative process was saying, well, what could our role be? Well, it turned out we need to be able to have uh, clear and predictable funding sources in order for the AOC to dedicate resources to support our, our courts that are resource low. So that's where this budget stabilization piece comes in. As Mr. McCormick stated, AA revenue has continued to decline. Uh, it, and I think actually it looks like, you know, we're consistently 25% below the benchmark of uh, fiscal year 18. And so the, the idea that this is going to bounce back and become a stable funding source, it's, it's hard to just hope that maybe things will turn around. It also has to do with the impact of the precedence of the collection of administrative assessments. Restitution goes first, right? So, so if restitution goes first, uh, then it's the remainder of revenue that then will come in as AAs. So finally, one of the biggest pieces of this is how did we, we started thinking, well, how do we work collaboratively with the legislature to come up with a way to stabilize the budget 
that will allow us to be able to support our courts. And that's where the stabilization piece came in. We actually looked at the structure of the legislature and said, okay, look, the legislature has the ability to respond to emergencies and be flexible in their staffing from, from our view uh, on the outside uh, because of the ability to maintain reserves. So part of this package is to build on what was approved during the pandemic with that uncertainty instead of potentially having to revert funds and then come back and, and need them again. And so we also have the piece of amending the NRS, which is SB 58, uh, to be able to really model the legislature and have uh, our own holding accounts. What we're requesting is nothing unique or brand new. It just might not have been done at the same time or by the same entities at once. So then as I mentioned, SB 58, there's specifics on the slide, but the key to that is also coming from our strategic planning process. The idea is to establish the judicial fund to ensure that our court maintains appropriate resources to carry out our core constitutional duties, and then to also support the trial courts that need help and have asked for help in order for them to be able to manage cases and do their constitutional core duties as well. As far as it goes, um, the other piece of this is eliminating the percentages related to AAs. Currently, there are prescriptive requirements on both the judicial and the executive branch in the receipt of AAs and the use of those. Uh, the, the way that the SB 58 is written would then allow the legislature to still be able to see all that we're doing. It just gives a little bit more flexibility in dedicating resources related to that AA revenue. And we think that it's a good compromise of ensuring that you are able to see we are transparent with you about what AA funds are being used and how they're being used. Uh, thank you, Catherine. So as uh, we, we get a little bit more into specifics regarding how this, this would play out in terms of beyond the legislation you'll see before you, as has been outlined, uh, there are uh, budget stabilization enhancements within our budget to help effectuate all of this. Uh, the first one you'll see, uh, there are a, a number of enhancements within our budget accounts, uh, E310s and E910s that um, remove administrative assessment from the Supreme Court, uh, specialty court, and senior judge programs. And then they do a rebalancing of AA revenues between the remaining accounts. And the reason for that, if you'll recall back to the slide on the declining AAs, is the overall amount that came into the state when this budget was built, there was very little left over for the executive branch. Um, and it is my understanding, I can't speak for the executive branch, but it is my understanding that the administrative assessments have been removed entirely from the executive branch agencies that have hitherto relied on that fund source. That highlights the problem that we're trying to fix here. Uh, the situation is um, such that there just was not enough funding to go around, even within our own budget accounts, to keep the Supreme Court's budget reliant upon that fund source. Uh, and so the, uh, the functions that we have performed that have relied for a significant portion of the operating budget on that fund source, we are consolidating or proposing to consolidate within the AOC. Uh, leaving the Supreme Court, Specialty Court, and Senior Judge Program to operate fully general fund and have at least that stability there. So you'll see that in those decision units. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a, a series of decision units in E900s that transfer a number of budget accounts and consolidate them into one. Again, more flexibility within the AOC to operate between judicial education and judicial programs and services and 
uh, and the AOC to, to do what we need to do within ourselves uh, and be more nimble um, and respond to the things that come before us uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, and then finally, uh, with regard to stabilizing uh, uh, what we need to do as a branch, um, there's a decision unit you'll see that affects a number um, of things, but E225 in budget account, pardon me, budget account 1483 uh, requests staffing um, in order to separate from the state's accounting and HR systems. Um, as the committee, I believe, is aware, um, there has been an ongoing migration to a new system that the state has been working on for some time. As the judicial branch has used that uh, and tried to use it, uh, it has become evident that um, it has taken much more work than it is needed um, and efficient. And so uh, on the surface, it might look like, well, this isn't making us any more efficient because you need more positions to do it. I believe that even if we were not separating from the state, I would still need this staff in order to do it under the new system. So uh, I, I see it as a wash uh, and also giving the branch the opportunity to uh, act um, nimbly and efficiently on our own. Um, so you'll see that um, there are three positions related to accounting and one position related to HR. Um, the next big piece of our budget uh, is a compensation classification change, uh, which you'll notice in the base decision unit. This particular, uh, uh, this particular initiative uh, came about, has been coming about for a number of years. And I'll, I'll defer to Catherine Stocks on giving you more details as to how we came here. But as far as the fiscal impact goes, uh, it does contain, it does result in about a, an additional eight and a half million dollars of general fund. And this is for, this is for staff salaries. This is not for the judges. Uh, the judges are contained within the other bills, which we'll, we'll talk more a little bit about uh, later on. This is just for Supreme Court and Court of Appeals staff. Um, and a total, uh, a total budget need of 13 million between the general fund and, and the other fund sources within our budget. Um. Thank you, Mr. Myler. So it's not a surprise, and I imagine you're going to hear this throughout the session over and over about the struggles uh, across the state in recruiting and retention. Uh, just recently, we have uh, seen that there's creativity going on uh, on the executive branch side to try to find a way to be able to recruit and retain and giving managers more flexibility than the traditional adherence to a specific step and grade, but realizing that when you have a quality candidate, you have to act on it and you need to be able to make an offer that it's not going to compete necessarily with county and uh, municipality pay, but that at least is better than what has gone on for the last decade. Uh, as some of you may recall, in 2018, uh, the legislature approved a salary study for uh, the non-judicial staff of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. And that salary study was brought forth, but it wasn't acted on. Uh, we then actually see the silver lining in waiting to see what was going to come because that actually gave us the ability to take a completely fresh approach and say, well, what are our goals here? What is our, what is our vision? What are we trying to do to provide services to the people of the state of Nevada? And is our current structure really what's going to be able to get there? And is it going to align with what was requested as part of the strategic planning process? That's when we started to realize that it goes way beyond just the ability to recruit and, rec and retain based off of a step and grade system. We actually tried to just do a flat increase. Like, well, what if we tried to just do a cost of living? What would that look like? Well, with the state system, the established executive branch system that we have followed traditionally, 
you end up taking your lowest paid employees up into the grade 30s. Yet it still doesn't actually meet the needs of a flexible employer to be able to respond to the realities of the market that surrounds us. Um, it's my understanding that 10 years ago, there was not nearly as much of a diversified market of employment in Nevada. And so what, what do we do to address that question? Those are some of those, the things we posed when we were trying to figure this out. I think Todd, Mr. Myler, probably went through what? 15 different iterations of a potential classification and compensation schedule based off of what we had, and we realized that it just didn't work. So we then went and realized we had so many different job titles that were specific to one core duty, but didn't recognize that we as an, our goal is to be an employer of choice, we now have created that we have a support tier, a professional tier, a management tier, and, and that is recognizing that we have individuals that are subject matter experts in the various issues that we deal with and are required to deal with and support, but they might not necessarily be a manager. So the traditional way of saying, well, unless you have direct reports, you can't move up. We, we don't feel that that is the way that we can run the judiciary any longer. We need to be able to have, have the ability to say, you know what, you're a subject matter expert and we value what you're going to bring and the services you're going to provide. And so we created that track that doesn't require that someone be a manager in order to move up. I get a little passionate about this, so I do apologize. Um, I haven't seen anyone roll their eyes, but I've gotten a couple head nods. That's right, I can't. Oh, so if you roll that way over there. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I hear, uh oh. Okay, so as we go forward, since this is an introductory one, we're happy to address specific requests questions related to this, but we have, uh, we have spent a lot of time and energy related to this and will provide the information on how we came to the, the step and or the getting out of the step and grade system and to the new classification and compensation schedule, schedule as part of the materials for, in preparation for our March 13th hearing. Did I miss anything? I think you got it. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so that is obviously uh, a big initiative within this budget and, and uh, we do appreciate the committees and the entire legislature's consideration of that. Um, and, and I think obviously it's been, it's been presented in an unorthodox way. It has been. It's very different than what you would normally expect to see in a budget request. And I think that highlights the vitality of this. Uh, the vital nature of what we're doing to the court. Um, we need this in order to continue to operate and, and be, as Catherine stated, an employer of choice. Um, we do have other budget requests uh, in, in uh, which you'll see. As I mentioned before, we are asking for new positions, a total of 32 new FTE. Uh, and uh, Quite a few of those, a good chunk of those, as I mentioned, are contained in uh, the AOC's budget account, 1483. Ten of them are auditors. And the reason why we're asking for ten auditors is because we only have three. And we have 70-some-odd trial courts around, uh, uh, limited jurisdiction courts around the state, another 11 district courts around the state. And it is a best practice, and the Supreme Court has required all courts to be audited on a four-year audit cycle um, to help them be, uh, protect the public and, and do things the way that it needs to be done. Um, however, with three auditors, with that many courts, I believe our time between visiting each court, if we remain on a regular schedule, has ballooned to 32 plus years, I think. Obviously, 32 years between an audit is not a good thing. Uh, many people change over. Lots of things change in 32 years. 
four years is a much more uh, regular and acceptable audit cycle. But with three auditors, it's impossible to get there. We need many more. So we've asked for 10, and we believe that though it will still take time to get that down to four years, with 10 new auditors, we believe we'll be able to do that. Um, so we really appreciate the consideration there to, to help our, our local trial courts to function the way they need to. And by the way, they don't just audit the, uh, the limiteds and the, and the general jurisdiction courts in the state. They also audit the Supreme Court and the AOC. We, we are subject to them, and they're good friends of mine. And <laughs> we get along, but they, they are at arm's length. And, uh, they're friends because they help us improve. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to work with them. Um, there are a number of other positions requested in here. I would highlight just a few. Uh, we have uh, in 1484 JPS, a family court specialist and, and a clerk specialist. These are uh, specific folks that have been asked for by the trial courts to help with a number of things. Uh, related to family law and also to help the clerks, particularly coming on with a new case management system, uh, to help them function at, at a high level. Uh, so that is a, they are currently, we are, have plans to bring those on funded with ARPA dollars. Uh, but because those can't really be used after December 31st of 2024. These new positions are slated to begin January 1st of 2025. Um, we have five additional trial court services IT positions in 1486 USJR. Uh, again, the support that the local courts need is a lot. Right now our trial court service desk only has three people and for that many uh, trial courts across the state, it's not enough. We need to grow in that unit. Um, so without belaboring more new positions, I would just highlight one more. There's uh, two new marshal positions, what we found, and, and I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate the, the need for security. Uh, our, uh, you know, we have within our buildings 10 elected officials, uh, and I, I'm sure you can appreciate the need to feel safe um, and not just for you, but for your staff. And what we found in, in uh, looking at things is that the marshals didn't quite have enough coverage to feel safe. Uh, and so we appreciate the consideration there. Um, some other enhancements of note, uh, I would highlight the audit software contained in 1483 AOC. As I mentioned, we need to get that audit cycle down from 32 plus years to four. One of the things that we need in order to do that is better software to track everything that the local trial courts submit to the audit union and get things out to them, et cetera, scheduling, calendaring, um, et cetera. Uh, and we think we've identified um, a possible solution there. We will certainly look uh, at all possible solutions, but we believe we can, we can get there within this request. Um, additionally, the Supreme Court requires that uh, it go through an independent audit every four years. Um, that is also contained within 1483. In 1494 Supreme Court, there is a request for a hybrid training facility. This is, uh, the vision is to have a centralized place where uh, not only judicial education can use it to uh, provide education for our judges across the state, but also to use it for uh, court staff across the state to help come in and have a centralized place where they can learn about the new CMS that's coming out, learn about the e-file system that's coming out, learn about civil traffic, et cetera. Um, and that would, we anticipate that to be a build out of the first floor of the Carson City Courthouse uh, using approximately, I think, half of the footprint that is currently the law library. Um, one bonus there I think the, the committee might be interested in is that yes, we have a lot of need for that in the judicial branch, um, but we can and will make that available to other state entities who need it. In as much as it is available, it's there, let's use it. Um, I'm not familiar with another training facility uh, within the state of Nevada uh, like the one we're contemplating here. Uh, so we appreciate the consideration there. Um, that's all I had on other budget requests. Uh, go ahead. 
thank you, Mr. Myler, for the record, John McCormick. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you'll see here that we have some other pending legislation that was meritorious of, of mention for this hearing. First of these being AB 16, and as the Chief Justice indicated, provides a cost of living increase for Supreme Court justices and uh, Court of Appeals judges. Um, and AB 15, which provides that uh, cost of living increase uh, to the district court judges. Um, what's a little different about these than bills you've seen before is it contains a mechanism that mirrors the existing mechanism for constitutional officers uh, for a combined COLA increase at the end of their term. So currently, as, as the governor, every term gets the combined COLAs um, that, that staff got during the term that, that would conform uh, the judicial positions uh, to that as well uh, and, and set that going forward. Then additionally, we have Senate Bill 63, which, and I know this is dangerous to say it's a cleanup bill because a lot of times we say things are cleanup bills, um, but but I promise this one is pretty cleany uppy, if I can use that as a <laughs> official term. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it, it makes a bunch of changes to chapter one, chapter two, to sort of modernize the language, uh, you know, not talk about publishing phone numbers in the telephone book anymore, but making the court's contact information available to the constituents through whatever electronic means are available and that type of stuff. Uh, it also changes a, a quirk we found in 281 where it still refers to the Supreme Court as a five member court, which has not been the case for quite some time now. Uh, so those are the other sort of uh, touch on financial aspects uh, legislation that we have in addition to the, the Supreme Court bills that will be heard by the policy committees. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Uh, Lydia Stiglitz, for the record. I know it might not feel like it right now, but these are really interesting and exciting times. And they are for, for the judiciary. COVID caused us to re-examine the way we do business, the way we deliver services to constituents, the way that we interact with trial courts. So they're exciting times, and exciting times are opportunity and opportunities to better serve. So we've really drilled down on, here, on our budget. We, are, we have a large percentage of our budget that's funded by administrative assessments. Administrative assessments are uncertain and were declining before COVID. Now, we have in 2019, Marcy's Law, which changed the order in which those are collected. COVID, where collections still have not recovered. And civil traffic, which has yet to be determined on how that, how that is gonna affect that funding source. So that funding source is uncertain. And it's a large part of our budget. And we feel like we can do it with this assistance, with these, these statutory changes that we're asking to manage to manage the money, um, still under the, the, the tutelage of the legislature and the oversight of the legislature. So we are open. I want to leave time um, for questions uh, that, that you may have, and our whole team is, is here to answer them. So thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Thank you very much for your presentation. And we do have a couple questions, and I'll start with Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I appreciate the passion and the arguments that are being presented, but I, I have a couple of questions. So on SB 58 that you explained, and not trying to go super deep, but w I guess what's bothering me is the statement about constitutional independence. And I feel like, I guess, being in the building for so long when when there is a discussion about encroaching upon powers that the legislature has, it worries me, right? Because I went while you were speaking and I looked at Article 6, Section 10. And so I, w I want to hear from you about how a provision in your bill where it allows you to eliminate um, the percentages and then determine on your own the percentages, how that's not a violation of Article 6, Section 10, which prevents you from determining fees for your own use. This is constitutional. And then Article 6, Section 15, and then Section 16, which basically says that all compensation is law, right? So that is in the wheelhouse of the legislature to then determine through law through statutory change, what is 
it compensation is going to be, right? And it's very specific that it says it doesn't allow changes within the term um, to be increased or decreased unless by law. And so what I'm trying to figure out is why would we give power that we have for ourselves away to, to the judiciary when the Constitution is really clear that it is law that is created by the legislature? That's what I'm trying to understand. I understand the argument that's being made historically and the change, but you can't have constitutional independence when certain powers have already been delineated to the legislature, right? This isn't an encroachment. It is, it is the separation that is established by the Constitution. And so help me understand those provisions in relationship to the bill and what you thought through. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Lydia Stiglitz, for the record, you know, turn to Mr. McCormick to get the specifics. Legislature has the power of the purse. So if you think of it as a purse that's given to us when, as the, the legislation currently stands, or the statutes currently stand, it's very delineated. It's two, it, within the AOC, 2% to this program, 8% to this program, 6%. So it's a purse with a bunch of zippers. And what we found is we have no ability to be flexible within that purse that you've provided to move money where it might be needed. So instead of, of reverting something that's here, while we are simultaneously coming to you asking to fill a hole over here, it would allow us to have the authority to move within that in some instances. So that's, that's kind of the, broad, the higher level, but Mr. McCormick, I'll turn to you for some more details. Uh, thank you, Chief. Again, John McCormick for the record. Um, as far as uh, the constitutional uh, provisions, administrative assessments, which I think we're, we're referring to by the percentage breakdown here, is that percentage breakdown 176.059. Administrative assessments don't provide um, judicial compensation, so I think they, they don't necessarily touch on that, that constitutional provision that uh, provides that aspect. And also those fees are set in 176.059 by the legislature. It's further down in the statute where it's the percentages that go to the AOC can be used for X, Y, and Z purposes. So I think that um, removing those percentages just uh, provides that money to the AOC to, to do those explicit uh, statutorily authorized purposes, but not at a percentage level. And it's not ceding legislative authority to create fees because those fees are set in statute, uh, as well as the use of those fees. What this does is just remove percentage set-asides for like judicial education, specialty courts, the operation of the AOC, um, and the senior judge program, and rather than say, you know, X percent goes to this program, it allows uh, the court to move money around for those various purposes, but not at the percentage level that exists in the current statute. So it's not a, a ju the judicial branch in, in this situation is not setting fees. It's just uh, sort of moving the, f the fee money around to meet the existing need as established by statute. A and again, AAs um, don't provide uh, <laughs> judicial compensation. Thank you for that response. Um, I understand what you're saying, and this will, I, I'm not on, probably, I'm not on, I've never served on the committee that this bill is probably going to go to, but um, the reversion is a problem. The determination of your own, the determination, then it becomes a power that shifted from us. That's how I'm seeing it. I haven't seen your bill language, so I'm going to leave it there. But I, I think you should examine Section 15 and section, section 16 and Article 6, and then we can have an offline conversation so you can help me understand how it works within those provisions because it's pretty clear those three sections are pretty clear in Article 6 when you go further down. And I just want, for my edification, right, for you to help me understand whether or not it's an encroachment or not, <laughs> whether or not this is a shifting of power or not, because those are the things that worry me all the time, whether or not it's governor or other, because we have power that we have given away, but that doesn't mean we want to continue to do that work of giving it away and, and removing balance that has been there. 
So those were just my questions, and we can talk offline. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Wynn. Thank you. I, I'm looking at um, this, and you're trying to create a statutory judicial fund that's not required to revert. Um, and I maybe I missed it, but how much money is reverting that you would be potentially carrying over? For the record, Todd Myler, uh, CFO. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, that has varied year to year. Uh, I, I, I would need to probably get back and look at a historical to, to kind of get you a realistic picture of what it is. Um, typically speaking, just off the top of my head, I know that we do revert with the, in the, the in the realm of uh, in the aggregate um, millions of dollars. Not millions, not crazy millions of dollars, but in excess of a million dollar, probably less than five each year. And, and if I may follow up, Chair. Yes. Um, is there any way you can get us the information on what, like if all of the money that you are so siloed, I guess, into like spending in certain categories, um, could you get to us where you are not spending that money? Because it sounds like you have a deficiency in certain areas, but you are obviously giving back money in other areas. And what areas are those? We can certainly provide that. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you for um, being here and presenting. I, I had a question regarding the uh, independent audits and the proposal for new, um, looks like there's going to be about 10 new auditors. You currently have three, um, and I believe you said there's a 32-year backlog. Um, <clears throat> or it would take 32 years to catch up with the current staff. Um, and, and so my question is, is that rather than hiring um, 10 new auditors, have you guys considered actually going out to a third party uh, vendor um, to get an actual independent um, audit so you guys could play catch up? Uh, I know we've used some audit fund or some ARPA funds to, to do some of that. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have ARPA funds available for that, but to me that would seem like a, a better way of playing catch up and then figuring out exactly how much staff you would need going forward. And, and then that would be my, my second question is, is of these 10 new positions, uh, if you used a third party to play catch up, how many would you actually need going forward um, to s stay up with the workload? Thank you for that question, Catherine Stocks, for the record. We actually did request exactly what you just proposed in our SLFRF. Uh, overall request that we sent to the GFO. Uh, we, asked it, we asked for those contract auditors to try to catch up, and we will be happy to provide you that information, provide the committee the information about that proposal. Those funds were not provided as part of our total request. Uh, and, and then your question on that, if we are happy, uh, wait, Chief Justice, am I allowed to say, we are happy then to bring that request back on the table if there happen to be funds that might be available to execute that initial catch-up audit. One of the biggest um, nuances that comes with hiring a firm to come in and do those audits is that a standard gap audit doesn't necessarily identify some of the issues related to the processes and procedures in a trial court. So we have a set of standards that court ordered um, minimum accounting standards that the trial courts are required to follow and also the specialty courts. And so there is a, a point of time and a, a a specific amount of training that can go into getting an auditor up to speed when they go in and look into a case management system. As I said, we're decentralized. We have 15 different case management systems that are deployed in the state. And so there is a, a learning curve for an auditor to understand how that case management system works to understand if the information, if money is going into trust and being held appropriately. Uh, those kind of situations do take a little bit of time. So going back to the idea of the silver lining, while we would really like to have the contractors, 
part of that knowledge transfer might be lost then if we switch to FTE. But I think it's a really good discussion for us to have about how we could potentially move forward. I did notice that IFC had approved FTE for some executive branch agencies instead of requiring that it be contractor. So if we could even get off the ground with an initial amount and provide a proposal of this is what we think it would take to get caught up and then go into that cycle and show this would be the FTE level that we would need uh, once we, if we had that big push and it would, it would show that you wouldn't maintain all those staff, but you could drop off. But that really would be the request is to be able to have those actually be FTE so that once the federal dollars expire at the end, if you have them, depending on whether that ends up being 2024 or 2026, depending on the encumbrance, right, or the obligation of those funds, then we we would have even into the next session to, to really be able to come back and say this is what we've done and this is what it looks like going forward and be able to provide you an even better picture of what it looks like to guarantee that we have that four-year audit cycle on both the trial courts and our specialty courts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Gansert. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so regarding the audits, you know, we've done something like that before when we had a backlog on data information that needed to be uploaded uh, for criminal background checks. I know we gave them like a bolster of funds to be able to clean it up and then move on from there. Um, going back to your stabilization account or the proposal, I'm, I'm thinking that the state provides operating funds but does not provide funds for your buildings and maintenance and so forth. And one of the examples that you have here is like an HVAC system. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're to propose something like that, it probably has to be specific about what type of expenses you'll have. And then if you were to look at our stabilization accounts, most of them have a cap. So you can fill a bucket up to so many dollars and then it reverts. And then also the ability to sweep it. So if we have reserve accounts places and we have an economic downturn, we're always able to sweep reserves. So just some thoughts on that. And so I, I, the actual bill number, if you have a bill number, wasn't mentioned in the last part of your slide. So I don't, I don't know if the bill's been drafted or not, but those were some questions, I guess, and some ideas and some questions I had. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John McCormick, for the record. Uh, <clears throat> the creation of those funds is in that Senate Bill 58, and, and currently caps and sweeps are not included in the language, but um, obviously that's a matter for discussion going forward. Th thank you. Thank you, caps, and then the ability to sweep it if, if the legislature needs to come back and sweep it. That's the other thing that all of our reserve, to my knowledge at least, all or maybe most have the ability to be swept if uh, we have an economic <coughs> downturn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assemblyman Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just had a quick question about, uh, I noticed you discussed education and increased staff for that. I know um, there's also there's been in particular a lot of discussion about uh, increasing education on water issues among the court. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that um, and if that is part of what's uh, contemplated in that uh, aspect of your budget. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman John McCormick, for the record. Uh, currently, we actually are working with the State Engineer's Office and have a separate commission examining water law and coming up with best practices. Uh, we partnered with the National Judicial College. They've done some education on water law. But creating those additional positions as well as a training facility gives us a space where we can regularly produce that content. People can come here. We're not going out to look for a venue to do it. It will also greatly enhance our ability to um, uh, produce distance education content for not only judges, you know, if it's water specific or bail or whatever the issue may be, but also to boost our offerings for court staff because as, as Catherine indicated, during the strategic planning process, that's a gap that was identified across the state. Um, you know, so, so again, it will, will enable that uh, education and information, and, and as you're aware, education is required by Supreme Court order as well as statute. So, um, but yes, and we're working on water stuff. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair. You you may have kind of um, touched on this a little bit. It is back to the audits. Are they strictly gap audits? Um, financial audits, or is there also included in that um, judicial processes, uh, compliance with regulation? If you could just touch on that a little bit. Uh, 
Thank you, Assemblywoman. Catherine Stocks, for the record. Yes, that is part of the audit process, uh, especially related to uh, data gathering and, and compliance with the statutory requirements to be able to produce data that leads to the annual report that we are required by statute to produce. So that's actually part of it, and that's why I say there's the there's the learning curve of how a court actually does a process, and individual courts may do it a little bit differently, and so the auditors need to see in that trail of process from filing to clerk to accepting the filing to notifying parties to then scheduling hearings and actually how then it's adjudicated. Those are part of the questions that are asked, which does take a little bit more time, but it ends up yielding better results because then courts are able to realize where a particular process might impact your, um, you know, a traditional phone call over the phone. Well, how does that look as far as ensuring that we're having financial controls in place? So yes, and if you would like more information, I'm happy to have our auditor follow up. That, that makes sense. I've, I've been an auditor in the past, and there is a learning curve with every industry, and mm -hmm. so that makes sense that you're, um, that's a great clarification. You're doing compliance auditing as well. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblyman Yeager. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, not really so much a question, but just wanted to um, comment on the administrative assessment fees and, and to recognize uh, Justice Hardesty, because I think as long as he's been in this building, he's been shouting from the rooftops about the instability of that funding. And, you know, I think that's at least 10 years he's been saying that. So I'm, I'm just happy that we're finally moving away from that, uh, both in your proposal and the governor's proposal. And uh, in addition, I think with respect to the independence of the judiciary, it always struck me as potentially problematic that courts were assessing fines and fees to defendants that were then used for the court's budget. So I'm just I'm really happy that we're getting away from that um, and just wanted to make that comment and also recognize uh, Justice Hardesty, who hopefully is on vacation somewhere and not watching this hearing. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure he's taken this all in. Uh, any additional questions from the committee? Uh, Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. On your salary increases, I've noticed several times, like your law clerks, you mentioned a maximum salary of $95,000. What's the range that you currently have for them, and what are you going to? 95 is a nice maximum, but what's the range you're... Uh, certainly. Actually, our law clerks uh, are single term. They don't accrue benefits. Right now, they're at 65 on employee employer. Okay. Approximately 70, according to the CFO. Uh, so actually, where that number came from is because that was part of our uh, study across the state and in national positions working in Supreme Courts, but that is a standard salary uh, for both Washoe, uh, ooh, I don't have the number before me. Uh, what I can do is actually follow up and give you that concrete example of that survey that we did, because I don't want to misstate for the record. Uh, but it is important to, to note that that is employee, employer paid, not accruing the benefits, and so even if it is set at the same as the Washoe amount, Amount, that doesn't include the purse. So you're already taking, depending how that looks after this session, whether it's maintaining in the 15s or whether that goes to 17% off. But you're going extremely higher than what the governor's recommending in his budget for classified employees. You're looking at a $25,000 increase? 75, 70, what did you say, 70 to 95,000? Certainly. So when you look at that, the stagnation of cost of living increases and raises for employees, one of the biggest trick, well, difficulties with this is that we actually looked at executive branch. We didn't know what the executive branch was going to propose. So without knowing what that was going to be, uh, it, it brings forward conversations. But I think Justice Stiglitz might be able to state it better than I am right now. 
I don't know about that. Lydia Stiglitz, uh, for the record, to recruit and retain law clerks who are integral to the processes of the Supreme Court, we compete, as you might imagine. We compete nationally. We compete locally. So a law clerk at, just for instance, Washoe, uh, at the Washoe Court, the Second Judicial District Court. Can you press your button? It, it is? is pressed. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So uh, a law clerk I I at the Washoe District Court, again, they, their PERS are paid fully. So when I came over from the second JD, I brought my law clerk, and my law clerk took a $15,000 pay cut to come clerk at the Supreme Court. Now, she came anyway, bless her, and I was grateful. But in terms of trying to compete, again, nationally and locally, that's kind of where the number, um, the number landed. And, and certainly, we're open um, you know, to, to, to feedback. We, we've tried to do the legwork, and we appreciate that's all over. Everyone has difficulty um, you know, with recruitment and retention, even in this changing labor market. But that's one of the kind of immediate problems that, that we're facing in terms of getting people to come. And, and I appreciate that. But I'm, all the departments and the governors, Everybody's trying to compete right now with Clark and Washoe County. Maybe the solution is we don't allow Washoe and Clark to pay what they're paying and restrict them, uh, is what I hear. We all made choices. Your clerk made a choice to come work for you. Uh, I made a choice when I left one agency to come to the state. I knew I was taking a considerable drop in pay, but I had, there were certain benefits I had working for the state that I enjoyed. And that's why I stayed with them for 30 years, knowing the pay difference. So I just wanted to look at what that difference is, trying to keep it in agreement with what the classified employees are looking at, too. We've got to stay fair, I believe, across the board and standardize. So I appreciate that. The other question, if I may ask one other question, Chair? Please, and then we'll finish up. Okay. Um, AOC, is, what are they doing to assist the rural counties in their bail issues on the 48 hours? <clears throat> uh, thank you, John McCormick, for the record. Uh, unfortunately, what we found with the rural counties in dealing with 48-hour bail hearings is it's generally a lack of, of lawyers, uh, either on the, the district attorney or the public defense side. Um, you know, w we have... <clears throat> Extend and continue to try to extend and, and improve bandwidth and provide video conferencing equipment, those things to enable it. But when we get down to it, that I think is really what, what the rural jurisdictions are struggling with, are having physically the people there to be able to, to conduct those hearings. So I understand correctly, it's their problem. Uh, An AOC really can't <laughs> assist any further than providing uh, video uh, th thank you. Um, John McCormick, for the record. Uh, yes, traditionally we're, we're obviously a decentralized judiciary, and those resources, particularly from the district attorney and the public defender side, are provided by the county. Um, you know, w we at the AOC are unable to say you shall to a county, obviously. Um, so we, again, have provided education for the judges using our judicial education department, um, you know, and those type of things. But ultimately, we can get it down to it. We just, the resources may not currently exist. And not, not disparaging the counties paying for it, but like there aren't people who live in some of the communities to do that legal work. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today with us. We appreciate the information and the overview, and please don't hesitate to reach out to committee members if you have to give them more additional information at some point. Thank you very much, and uh, we will move on to our next agenda item. Thank you. Our next uh, item on the agenda is the Department of Public Safety, and um, I see Director Tagliati in the audience, so you may bring your team forward, and please begin your presentation when you're ready.
Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, I'm George Tagliati, Director of the Department of Public Safety. I want to say good morning to everyone. And with me this morning uh, is I have my Deputy Director, Sherry Brigham,an who formerly was our senior fiscal person for the Department of Public Safety. And to her right is Curtis Palmer, who is presently our senior fiscal person. And to his right is Kim Smith, who is our public information officer. All three have, uh, along with our staff and who are in the uh, audience, have done a really great job and put a lot of time into this presentation. Uh, in fact, our biggest challenge was making sure we could keep it within the time frame. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry and she'll begin the uh, slide presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Good morning, Sherry Brigham,an for the record. And um, I just want to say that this may look daunting to you, but I will skip through a lot of slides. So don't, don't worry. Um, but I will leave enough time for you to ask questions as needed, and um, we'll be happy to answer them at the end. Um, I'm sure you've seen our, the head of our page showing all the videos and the media coverage on the troopers not being able to um, cover their shifts or cover their mileage or the roads. Um, and while it is true, we have been losing officers now for years, um, it has gotten to a point where we're going to call it the make it or break it. So um, if we can't start stopping the bleeding this year, we're not sure we'll be around by next year. And having just listened to the last uh, presentation, I imagine you're going to be hearing this all day and probably all week. I haven't listened to them all. But um, while you've seen and heard about the shortage of troopers, you may not realize that our parole and probation has been facing the same hardship. Um, it's been very difficult, and um, parole and probation kind of has a lower profile. But our concern is, is the caseloads are so high now, they couldn't possibly be managed well. Um, the next page is a picture of all of us, just so if you see us in the hall, you can track us down. Um, and the page after that are just the highlights we're going to talk to you about. Um, the primary issue is recruitment and retention efforts. Um, offender tracking system for Otis, that's parole and probation management system. We're pleased to say it is back on track, and we hope <clears throat> that it will be installed and on maintenance by this coming biennium. Insidious modernization as well. This has been funded, as you'll see later on, um, by ARPA funds instead of general funds. Um, but it should be wrapping up its initial um, installation and use for all the counties this biennium and then start in its maintenance mode. And then finally, I want to touch on our state headquarters building um, and lab that we have proposed. Um, we've had some uh, drawings and discussions with the architects. And it will be a beautiful, beautiful be building. So I just want to make sure that you all um, get a chance. If you have anything to say about it, say yay. Um, it'll be the first time that we have ever had all of our divisions in one location. Um, department of Public Safety is a large department, not by some comparisons, but we are probably the only large department that doesn't have a headquarters building. We're spread out throughout Carson City. And the next slide is one that most of you who have been here for um, several bienniums should be familiar with. Um, this is our separated versus higher, higher ratio. And the point uh, that we're trying to make is um, how we are hiring versus the loss. And we're at about half. And as that continues, it will continue to have and have. And our very large concern is, is that the agency as it exists today 
may not in a couple years. And I know I'm sounding gloom and doom, you know, I, and I know the passion is there too, and you've heard all that before too, but our officers are tired and weary, um, and I do worry that um, any kind of offer from another agency, whether it be Metro, Washoe, Sparks, they're gone, especially if after this legislation, something isn't done for them. Um, the next page includes the uh, vacancy rate by division. Um, in most cases, uh, we're in a difficult situation, not only with our sworn staff, but with our administrative staff as well. Um, our fiscal staff is getting to be um, almost non-existent, thank God for Curtis, um, but our p, &P division has virtually no fiscal staff left out of a total of about 10, eight. Um, we just lost the ASO three and two this year. So now Curtis's staff, our staff, is doing double and triple duty to try and keep that going. Um, skip that page. Yeah. Uh, the next one is a sworn vacancy rate, and I believe this is actually just the officers. Um, as you can see, our total vacancy rate for our officers is 32%, um, making it really hard to um, complete our missions. The next page um, represents the sworn officers in the field and the locations they are not in. So where you see 100% means there are no officers there. Um, it's kind of a big deal, and I know the Senator will uh, agree he's been concerned about it for some time. Moving on to the next page, this is the, again just the officers for the big sworn divisions. Highway Patrol sitting at 32% vacancy, parole and probation is sitting at 36% vacancy, investigations is at 5 and Capitol Police is at 18%. The next slide is more to highlight the vacancies in our civilian staff. And that's um, in the yellow, you're going to see that um, we have our dispatchers and our admin staff. And considering how many we have and the vacancies there, it's amazing that we manage to answer the phone at any given time. Um, then in blue, you see the accounting folks. And again, looking at those percentages and vacancies, I'm just glad we were able to present some kind of a budget to you this year. Um, on the next page, this is the big question of why, and seriously, law enforcement agencies nationwide are facing a serious shortfall. As a result, law enforcement agencies across the nation are offering hiring and retention bonuses in addition to a multitude of other benefits. So why is DPS facing a recruitment challenge? Well, the pictures you see are not from DPS, but those are local law enforcement ads. DPS couldn't acquire ARPA funds for advertising and marketing. And the department had to use forfeiture funds for our one and only test uh, billboard. Uh, and then last January or February, President Biden added uses for the ARPA funds to allow law enforcement to have, um, sorry, I lost my place, um, incentives for retaining. So the DPS requested several times um, for um, these, I don't know why I can't get that word right, retention bonuses. And the proposal would have kept them in place for every, every paycheck, they would have gotten $500 just for being here. And the intent was to get us through this fiscal year so that you had an opportunity to evaluate and make any changes necessary for the next two fiscal years. Unfortunately, that wasn't approved either. And in the meantime, we lost 134 officers. 
the next few slides are, again, the reason for the issue that we have. Remember that this is an issue across the nation, the world, in fact. And the pay issue is always going to be an issue to the smallest fish in the pool. So as long as Washoe, Metro, Henderson, uh, Sparks, Carson all offer competitive wages with each other, there's not a whole lot of movement. But when we are 25% behind, there's a lot of movement, and it's all one way. So the first slide you see here is uh, the Nevada State Police, starting with officer all the way up, comparing to uh, Las Vegas Metro. There's a, this is using just pay policy three, which is PERS paid. The purpose for that is to compare wages only and take PERS out of the equation. Most law enforcement um, agencies have their PERS paid by the counties. Um, and so the only way to even compare apples to apples is to use pay policy three for our officers. At any rate, you'll see on this page that um, Metro offers about 55% more in pay. The next page is um, Henderson offering 30% more. Uh, the next page is uh, Clark County School Department. They even make 31% more. Um, and then North Las Vegas, 28% more. Um, and Washoe County, 49% more. Carson, 35% more. And Reno is 40% more. Sparks, 41. And Elko, even, is 17% more. So if you look at all of the southern Nevada um, lo local law enforcement, um, they've always made significantly more. Um, and so if you take that average of all of them, including the lower paid ones, it's about 24 percent difference in pay. Unfortunately, that's where our largest base is, too. So for them to keep up their numbers, they have to take them from us. And they do it as early as right out of academy and as late as um, middle management. Um, the next page is all northern Nevada averages, and that is 31 percent. And then the central Nevada averages of 17 percent. All of all, all, um, all of them, the entire state average is 24% uh, more than the department is making right now. And while we appreciate and support the governor's idea for a two-grade adjustment and the 8% COLA, that's approximately 18% for the first year. And as you know or have heard, PERS is going up significantly for law enforcement, which is going to reduce that again. So the problem in the end is while we don't quite make it to the 25, 24 percent increase now, it's going to multiply over the biennia again, and we're going to find ourselves in the same situation. Um, <clears throat> other than the colas offered to all the other state employees, not that I have a problem with that, um, law enforcement has not received any kind of increase um, since 2005. Um, the next page is kind of a, a segue into a career life. This is Charlie. He retired with 29 years in as a law enforcement officer. Um, and we have fewer and fewer officers staying 29 years. 25 they can go. Um, so 29 years is pretty impressive. And if there was a way to incentivize them to stay longer, we'd be thrilled, either through PERS, a drop program, either through uh, incentive pay. Their knowledge is so important to us because we don't have the staff to teach the other staff. We don't have the longevity to, um, that has amassed all the brain trust to be able to pass that on. So the next page kind of gives you a bigger picture of um, where we are for a career. So in the north, 
We're possibly $400,000 away during a career of an officer. Um, in, uh, this is Washoe, I'm sorry. There it's uh, another CBA. Um, we are $1.1 million away from a captain. Um, so I think you've got my point. That's what I was gonna flip through. Um, we, we, as the state officers, are competing with the local law enforcement. Unfortunately, it's just the way it is. And to be able to not lose them, we have to be, we have to have a more c competitive pay and benefit plan. Um, but I'm sure you want to know what we're trying to do about it where we can. So I've got in here a couple of slides that talk about our recruitment efforts. And the first slide is Doug. He's our Southern Nevada recruiter. This is new for us. We took two officers off the roads to try and help us recruit, to establish relationships with applicants, schools, mm -hmm. colleges, universities, the military. And then on the next page, you have our Northern Nevada um, recruiter, Elaine. And he's been wonderful. He's been with us the longest. Our first um, Southern Nevada recruiter, by the way, left us to go to Metro. So um, we are doing a lot of things to try and move things along. Um, we do the polygraph first now in the backgrounds, and that has definitely made a difference. We no longer have background backlogs. Um, we provide conditional offers earlier in the process, pending outcomes of tests, et cetera. Um, we have a lateral matrix, so if somebody is already in their um, ELCO, for instance, um, they're an officer, been there six years, we have a matrix that says they can come over with us at a higher rate than just the ones that we're used to being required to give. Um, we have a weekly management team, and I think we've talked about that before with all the leadership that has anything to do with or touches recruitment. Um, our uh, new recruitment officers have really pushed on the mentorship program and been working out with people, individuals. Um, Doug has been actually testing, pre-testing with people who are worried about the physical fitness tests. So he works out with them individually, at their need, he, he, they're all very, very busy and very creative in where they go and who they talk to. Um, I couldn't have been more pleased with, with those folks. They've just done such a wonderful job at getting our name out there. Um, another one was help with uh, SkillBridge, which is the National uh, Department of Defense program, and that's to help veterans coming out of the military get placed in a job. So our benefit is, is we go ahead and interview them six to nine months before they come out of the military. And if they'll fit in any of our positions, including sworn positions, then the last six months they're scheduled to work for us and the federal government is taking paying the bill. So um, by the end of it, we've got an employee who's trained, and assuming they do a good job, they've got a job. So um, we were one of the first to launch this, and I believe we have one in the academy now through the SkillBridge program. Um, we did create a new career and recruiting website, um, and we do have virtual information, videos on how to prepare for the tests, all the physical fitness stats, et cetera. So now uh, the department detail. We are in the parole and probation. And normally we talk about the M200s, um, which are the um, adjustments to the caseloads with JFA, that is the institute that provides our projection on the offenders coming in and out of prison, et cetera. So uh, M201 projects um, that uh, that there would have been a loss of officer, or not officers, uh, PNP specialists. Um, M204 actually reverses that based on new methodology by our um, staffing study that changes the matrix there. 
An M202 is the typical caseload adjustment in accordance with JFA caseload based on law enforcement officers that nets us nine DPS positions and four new DPS sergeants. And on the next page, you see um, Officer Juvanti Jones, who's still with us, yay. And um, the list of asks for the PNP office, um, we are looking at uh, reestablishing the division's state funded house arrest program, um, and that was cut during COVID. Uh, and it's a wonderful intermediate sanction for the parole and probation violators to avoid reincar reincarnation, reincarceration. Um, and it's certainly less expensive than leaving them in jail or putting them in jail. And the next uh, decision unit we wanted to highlight is, in fact, the um, two-grade increase for the DPS officers and sergeants that the governor recommended. And we have included um, our amendment um, to increase that to all officers of all ranks. Um, we um, have requested the amendment, so we don't know that it'll happen yet, but we're hoping. Um, with parole and probation, the next item is Otis again, and I think I touched on that earlier. Um, that's our management system that we have been desperately waiting for and hoping that it will be in existence before our old Otis just dies. Um, but everything's looking good with the new vendor, and we're on track. Uh, we should even see, I think, the whole thing up and working around December. Aaron. Yes. Okay. Oh, and that was um, Jess, who was an officer at the time, the picture that you see, um, uh, working with one of her clients. Um, she's now been promoted to a sergeant and works on our recruiting team. The next slide is, again, some statistics that you can appreciate. Um, uh, it is comprised of the various types of supervision, parole, probation, lifetime supervision, sex offenders, and then we also have conditionally released inmates, but it's such a small population, it's not represented well in these charts. Since the last biennium, we've seen a decrease in uh, PNP parole and probationers, um, likely to AB 23. So the populations have decreased. However, lifetime supervision, sex offenders, and inmates have stayed pretty much the same. Um, we do have five retirees who've come back out to help us with caseloads and extraditions. Um, but unfortunately, it's just a drop in the bucket. Uh, sergeants are having to perform officer duties, such as intakes and officer supervision. Um, and we're paying tens of thousands of dollars a month in overtime just to keep things afloat. Some of our rural officers look better than others. However, these values do not account for all the windshield time that they face traveling to the offenders, meaning that they are driving so far to all their locations they lose time and can't handle the ca same caseload as we would in, for instance, a city area. So uh, the rural officers strive for a 0.8% caseload, meaning that if all the matrices are done right, we allow them two-tenths of a percent just because of their drive time. Um, next slide. Uh, this is one of our um, little statistics that we put out I thought you might enjoy um, in the Southern Command. And... Um, it can be updated on a monthly basis. I believe that um, they have been trying to make sure that everybody understands the volume that they're dealing with. And next we have Highway Patrol, and that's Ashley, our Southern Command PIO for Highway Patrol. And again, um, public safety uh, at, in total, but highway, speci highway Patrol specifically is requesting the two grade increase as um, the governor has requested. And then again, we're preparing an amendment to make that all um, law enforcement. 
Um, the next uh, decision unit is something that's been requested for about 10 years now, and that's the expansion of highway patrol um, with the addition of 28 sworn positions. We have um, several highways. Well, I mean, the idea that we're 24-7 on the highways is, is just not true at all. In fact, it's, it's rare, um, especially outside the cities. So this is for Highway I-15 and which one? 80. 80, thank you. Um, to expand our coverage, to get close to 24% or 24/7 coverage on those roads due to the fatalities that have happened. And um, following on the very last item here, you'll see the staffing study. Um, that is expected to go on during this biennium so that we can determine if that will be enough. But even so, we can have the positions if we can't fill them. Another story entirely. Um, we have added a few people for management analysts and fleet and radio positions um, that will centralize um, especially the radios. We have new radio systems coming on over the biennium. And then E725, we had requested last year, but it didn't quite make it, not last year, last biennium. And these are oral fluid testing equipment for the roadside. And that's to determine if it's not alcohol, for instance, if they pull somebody over, suspect them of a DUI, and they end up blowing no alcohol, it doesn't mean they're not under the influence of something. This will give us a better indication if it is something that should be tested for or if this is just uh, some other issue. Uh, the next page, vehicles. We do have our usual replacement of vehicles. I have a minor correction. We are purchasing um, plan to purchase 108 police interceptor utilities to replace those that meet their mileage threshold and five SUVs. Um, and these are all depending on our vehicles being mileaged out. So if I say I'm, I'm purchasing 108 and only 105 mileage out, we will only spend 105 or buy 105. Also, uh, replacement of the motorcycles, and that's eight. The next slide is the investigation division. Um, there are unsung heroes. Most people aren't even aware that they exist, but um, we are for them as well, asking for the two grade upgrade plus the amendment to make it all ranks. Um, and we have asked for uh, oh, a uh, general appropriation to replace expired grant funding for the Safe Voice program. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Safe Voice, Voice program, that's the children's program for schools that um, the health department funded with grants um, where we have 24 co 27, 24 7 coverage. Um, to ensure that there's somebody on the other end of the line and emails. There's numerous ways to call for emergencies, for threats, for bullying, anything along those lines. Um, I remember uh, um, a very touching um, explanation when last we were up here explaining what Safe Voice does and the suicides that were prevented. So um, it's a huge program that kind of goes unnoticed. But on the other hand, um, it's done extraordinarily well, good results, and now we just need to replace the ending grant fund with general funds. And where is my other decision yet? Oh, okay. No, that one isn't it. The one where we are asking for staff. I've got the wrong page. Oh, my apologies. Okay, so um, we are uh, requesting uh, another amendment to return investigations to the pre-recession staffing for sworn. And it's total of 36 positions. I don't know if you recall or 
not, but back in 2010, 2012, in order to make the cuts for the recession, we had to pretty much dismantle investigations by two-thirds. Um, we moved everybody out of El Las Vegas area, moved them up north, and just did as much as we could with what we had. Uh, minimal task force staffing on our part. Um, it was, it's been difficult, yet their statutory requirements have actually increased during that time. And they can't possibly be effective with the staffing that they have today. Um, moving on to records and communication and compliance division. The Communication Bureau, which is dispatch, and I'm sure you understand their support, is also in crisis with regard to their vacancies. And we have an amendment in process to include them in the two pay increase. Um, we do have a program where we are transferring all the technical BPAs um, that are specific to our divisions into the director's office so that we can use that technical staff to support the whole department. Um, and then in criminal history, uh, we did receive that ARPA fund to replace uh, the general fund for the insidious modernization. And then next, state fire marshal, um, again, a two-grade upgrade increase for the DPS officers and then an amendment. We are um, going to be looking for an acceleration dog, and um, we have one, I think, in process right now um, that we are looking to bring on, which will certainly help our arson investigators. So they go out. They believe that you know arson is there, and they can spend hours looking for the source or the material to try and test to prove it or prove what was the combustible, where these dogs are trained to go directly to it. Um, and we do have some help for our plans bureau. These are the folks who review all the plans for life and safety. And we can't keep up with them. That's where most of our revenue comes in. And uh, so we are happy that that is the case. Um, we are preparing an amendment to return to pre-session um, fire and life safety inspectors. Um, those are the folks that go around to the schools and the counties and any state building and check them. And we have not been able to do that effectively in a decade. The next staff, you're going to see our wonderful Kevin and Steve and Quan standing on the steps of the mansion, not the mansion, I'm sorry, the Capitol. And these are our Capitol police officers. And again, we have um, the two grade upgrade for them as well. And um, you may note or remember that in the prior bienniums, we were asking to bring them up from officer ones to twos, and we finally got that accomplished this fiscal year. Um, as your legislative security office or police um, could tell you, because they're mostly our ex folks, we compete with them. And since they got their upgrade well before we got our upgrade, um, it's just another way to show you the difference in the competition. All of them are wonderful, and our teams do work very well together. I think our Capitol Police effort and our um, uh, uh, legislative police are a wonderful team, and they are constant communication to keep us all safe. And finally, we have the director's office, office and um, we are asking to cover our public records request software um, with our total cost allocation instead of using forfeiture funds. We're adding, adding hopefully, two personnel technicians, three. Our loss of um, staffing in HR is, is incredible. We weren't able to keep a single um, technician two a year for the last 10 years. Um, 
it, the turnover is very great, and we were missing that step in the ladder to keep them in our department so that we can continue to promote them and retain some of that knowledge. And every time one of those folks leave, we lose that basic knowledge, especially during this time of change with success factors. So there are so many things changing. People have learned the new system or the old system, but not both. And so holding on to these folks long enough to be able to make it work will be very helpful. Um, then we have the uh, Joint Emergency Training Institute, or JETI. Um, we're looking to be a, a partner in that whole program, which will enable us to use their um, shooting, firing ranges, gun ranges. Um, as well as their facility that includes all kinds of the latest and greatest technology. Um, there's room for us to actually train our academy there as well. And then we'd be joining forces with the South um, to add consistency to the methodology of, of total law enforcement. We think it's a fantastic partnership, and it provides us with a much-needed space and training facilities that we don't have. Also, um, within the director's office, as I mentioned, that we will be moving all the technical folks, including the BPAs, um, into one area so that we can redistribute the health to the whole, the help to the whole department. Um, this will really make a difference since you may remember um, back in 2012 or 14, uh, we lost our own IT. Um, division to the state and we have tried and they have tried it's just we are one of those anomalies where none of our systems are similar to any other state system and our systems serve the counties and cities and the other law enforcement um, so it's really important that uh, we have our own priority and unfortunately there's no way um, EATS could possibly take care of us only and ahead of everybody else. Um, so we need to coordinate our staff to make better use of the time that we have um, to allocate time to programs that require immediate help um, and then getting all the new programs working like in Siege's modernization and OTIS. Office of Traffic Safety. Um, we're just request, requesting funding for the eSight system. This is the system that we've used to try to accommodate Bill um, AB 116, and that was changing the citations from um, criminal to misdemeanors. And um, this has been an issue because we definitely need to get the eSight system upgraded in order to accommodate all the reclassifications, especially the Knox in the counties. There's just so many different things that are tied to each issue um, that prevent us from moving in a smooth direction as AB 116 requested. Um, although we've made quite a few gains, I don't want you to think that we haven't done it. And then um, we have asked for a uh, Grants and Projects Analyst 3 position. And finally, that is an actual picture of our architect's rendering of our new um, office. Uh, I think that's a view to the garage um, that would be on the um, Highway 395 right here in Carson City at, what's the name? The property. The... The old armory. Old armory. Thank you very much. Um, we play this game often. I'm, you know, getting it over. So at the old armory, and so that's just a pile of dirt right now. If you drive by it, it just looks like this fenced-in yucky area. So um, this will be the premier headquarters for um, the state headquarters building and a state lab, which would be the first because there are only two states. Oh, one now one state in the country that doesn't have a state lab. So um, we're hoping that if it comes to your attention, you'll kind of give us a shout out and say yay. 
um, to move forward. We've already had the architectural renderings and designs and lots of studies done. Uh, the next phase would, uh, uh, what's recommended to the governor as 23-P01 in the capital improvement program. This pro project will complete design of 161 900 161,900 square foot building and structured parking for the Department of Public Safety headquarters. That's what they're, I'm allowed to say. Uh, the next two slides are the parole board slides and Chris is in the background to answer questions should you have them. Um, in an effort to ensure public safety, the Board of Parole Commissioners renders fair and just decisions on parole matters on the law, the impact on victims and the community, and the goal of successfully integrating offenders back into society. Uh, the Board of Parole Commissioners has several decision units. One of them is uh, to request funding for fleet services vehicle uh, another is to realign the funding appropriate uh, for mandated training. And the third one is to fund a new director, executive director position and associated costs. Um, and one shots or special consideration, um, there's a replacement, a request for a replacement of 29 laptops and the rest is mostly replacement equipments, and I won't um, dwell on that. But the picture you have is Liz Dominguez, she's still with us, and Marcus, who unfortunately went to Metro. So there you have it. I am open to questions, as is anybody on my team, um, and happy to assist. Thank you very much for that presentation, and we do have several questions. Senator Harris, would you like to start? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think we saw quite a few slides kind of comparing NHP pay to some of the other municipalities. With the two-step grade increase and the 8% and 4%, do we know where NHP would then be in relation to some of those municipalities, right? How close do we get you? And my second question is, do you anticipate with those two things, the vacancy rate may go down and we can have some folks in Elko? Sherry Brigham in for the record. Um, we assume the two rank is going to be 10%. Uh, the 8% in the year brings us to 18% for just the first year. But we are looking at an increase in PERS, which can take that right back down to 13%. Um, so our goal would be to get the pay up to 25% increase just so we can start on the same footing as everybody else and then move forward. We'd love to see something in statute that kept us within 5% of the locals, um, something along those lines to keep us up with it. But our concern right now is, is holding on to who we have now and um, just the governor's announcement certainly made a difference. I believe last year in the first month we lost in the teens, I had it written down somewhere, and we've only lost six this year. So I, I hope that, that this direction and the attention is going to stay focused on that. And so I'm hoping even just discussing it in the open is going to make a difference. But my concern is if I don't get them to 25, this year, it's going to continue to erode and erode again, and we're going to be back to the same spot in two years. And losing my higher command staff is a real concern for me right now, because we, during the recession and COVID, have lost our brain trust in middle management. So we don't have people to promote. They're not ready yet. As a matter of fact, I have a vacant parole and probation chief. I've got two new majors 
covering the whole state. They're doing a fantastic job. Don't get me wrong. But still, that I don't have someone ready to walk into that position is, is of concern. So I don't want to lose them either. It's not just getting the new ones. It's holding on to um, the higher-end ones. Uh, George Tagliati, uh, for the record. Um, as recently as uh, last month, uh, the Henderson Police Department uh, advertised a lateral academy. And, there, and what that means basically is anyone who has already been certified as a Category 1 police officer, you're welcome to come with us and so on and so forth. That saves them a fair amount of money rather than put some person from uh, a recruit off the street with no experience uh, through an academy, which takes uh, four plus months and probably over 100000 I don't know the exact amount, but easily over $100,000. Um, that was last month. Uh, to... Um, Sherry's point, I think just the spirit right now uh, within our employees is the fact that they anticipate uh, a new day. They anticipate uh, that something's going to happen, that they're gonna, gonna be, their issues are going to be heard. You, you know what also is, is, um, is troubling, beside the fact that we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, is the fact that so many of our employees um, don't necessarily want to leave. And you, you hear the stories where they come up and say, well, you know, I really don't want to go. And I, and I would say, uh, why would you want to go to, no offense, but why would you want to limit yourself with the school police when with the Department of Public Safety, you have a whole state to live in, you have all these uh, diverse jobs that are available to you and so on and so forth, you know, trying to encourage them to stay. And they said, it comes down to uh, married two kids I need the money, I can't afford to turn down that money. And they can leave us uh, because it's the same retirement program, which always puzzles me, uh, and not skip a beat. But they can also come back. And I've had a fair amount of folks that say, we would really, really like to come back. Um, if you go to page 28, where we talk about our recruitment person, there's a gentleman there, Doug, who's our recruiter from the South, great trooper. His predecessor, uh, came to me personally uh, and almost apologized because he had to leave uh, and he went to Metro. And I said to myself, self, that's what we get for putting him <laughs> out there where, where people can see him and see the fact that this guy is, is a value to any organization and it's somebody that they can come and just and take away from us. And, and just by the way, he was also in our minority community and helped us with our recruitment in the minority community. So that lasted months, maybe, uh, when we put him in that position. And he was terrific. And he's gone. But he told me, you know, if we get a chance, I really like working with the Highway Patrol, and I'd come back. Uh, I'm not going to hold anybody to that. But there's uh, more folks that left us that had that attitude when they left that I find encouraging. Uh, it's, it's not the job, it's just the economic circumstances. And Madam Chair, can I ask just a quick follow-up? Go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. So, it's, it's a two-parter. Uh, do we know how much it would cost the state to cover the PERS contributions for your department? Second piece is, would that get you to the 25? Sherry Brickman, for the record, yes and yes. Um, I don't have the number with me. It's significant. Um, and I, I hesitate to say on the record, um, I, I, we just, we've done it so many times. I believe it was 20, 20 million a year. 23? 23 million a year. Sorry, 33. I'm sorry, 33. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Assemblyman Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this kind of dovetails with my colleague's question. So obviously when people leave, you talk to them about why, and it sounds like by and large it's compensation, which, which makes sense. Um, I just wondered if you had a chance to talk to folks who stay 
who maybe have opportunities to leave but don't, and what they tell you about uh, what it is about the agency uh, that that makes them want to stay. Obviously, we have work to do in the pay area. We know that, uh, but just wondering if you could share any of that insight, if you have that information. Uh, George Tagliati, for the record. Uh, again, this is uh, not a scientifically supported <laughs> uh, response, but uh, we do uh, engage with the folks who are going to leave and uh, I think uh, their attitude with the Department of Public Safety, whether it's the Highway Patrol or those that work in parole and probation, it's a unique position. The camaraderie within the Highway Patrol is uh, fantastic. Uh, the pride of being a trooper, a state trooper, uh, is, is beyond. Uh, parole and probation folks uh, have this fire in the belly where not only are they involved in law enforcement, but they're also involved in helping people get back on track. And that's a unique job within this type of law enforcement career. Uh, you can't find that elsewhere. So and most of the, and, and, and I think the, the proof in this is the fact that people don't have to make an excuse, but they want to make an excuse as to why they leave. Otherwise, they just walk out the door. I'm not going to say everyone's going to come back, but uh, it's... Uh, I think that they're, in their heart, they, that was the main reason that they wanted to leave. But we are, we have that diversity, and I tried to, we tried to sell that, where uh, I remember from, uh, similarly from my day when uh, I left the military and uh, was being recruited to um, go to work for the federal government. Um, would I want to work for the FBI or the, the DEA? The, the main attraction with the, the FBI was the fact that uh, I could do a whole bunch of different things. I could live in so many different places, and I wasn't limited to one type of investigation. Uh, so you could really expand your horizons. And I think we can translate that as well to a state position and that career with state law enforcement, where you're not just going to be pigeonholed into one particular area. And me personally, uh, this is just kind of <laughs> my idea, but if, if, if I'm a, a young person with... Uh, uh, family, I'd want to be in Elko or Ely and get a couple of acres and get a horse. And, and you, you can't do that if you're working for, for the Metropolitan Police Department necessarily. You try to buy a horse property in Las Vegas, good luck. And we don't pay enough. But, uh, so I, we, got a, we got a lot going for us, and uh, uh, I think we try to beat that drum. But, and I think that's the reason we get a lot of apologies for folks leaving. They don't owe us one, but... Thank you very much. And we'll go to Senator Titus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all uh, who are at the table and all the officers and, and, and folks that are in the um, committee room today listening to this. Um, my young highway patrolman, um, whose parents are some of my close friends, has me on speed dial and speed text all the time about issues going on in your department, and I have tremendous respect for him and all of you. Having said that, however, um, you made a statement early on um, about your ability to even sustain the Nevada State Police, also known as Highway Patrol. And I'm wondering if you could share with this body um, why we would want to keep you afloat. Um, we know that all 17 counties have sheriff departments and they can give speeding tickets and they can respond to accidents. What's unique about the state police that we need to keep going? And I already know one that I'm going to throw out there, and you maybe can um, expand on this before a little bit more. That on one of our IFCs meetings, we uh, funded uh, the equipment to do testing and weight testing on our um, trucks and commerce that comes through the state. And it's my understanding that it is critical that you monitor a certain number of these in order to get the federal funds. And so there are roles that. Um, I think you don't share enough on how important it is that we recognize it's critical that you stay part of this way more than fulfilling the judicial branches, tickets, and keeping them functioning, um, way more than that. And um, I, I just, can you expand on that a little bit? And then I have a follow-up question. Uh, George Tagliati for the record. Um, 
There, there are a couple of things. If you've driven lately in Las Vegas on any of the freeways, uh, you'll see that uh, finding the highway patrol or any kind of uh, traffic enforcement is, can be few and far between. A couple of months ago, uh, we had a tour of some VIPs and they were looking at our motorcycles, for example, and uh, uh, made the comment, you know, this kind of model and blah, 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 and what do they do? And this is what they do for traffic speed enforcement and so on and so forth. Um, the reality is, in Las Vegas right now, unless things have changed and since I last checked, um, we have pretty much one shift of those motorcycles, which would be about four to six, and uh, that would be one shift four days a week. So we could pick the shift, whether you want it to be graveyard, uh, day shift, etc. Similarly, in the north, we looking at our numbers, came to the point where are we going to be able to provide a highway patrol 24-7 in Washoe? Beside all of the ramifications with mandates and funding from the government, the federal government, uh, this becomes a really serious traffic safety issue if you go on social media and see how what used to be 65, 75 miles an hour is now 85, 95 miles an hour for folks that just don't really care. Uh, the number of traffic accidents, the number of fatalities, and so on and so forth. We look at an investigative division, for example, and that is our state police investigative division. They are mandated to do various things. I won't get into all the detail. But the mission is different from the rurals than it is from the major metropolitan areas. Think about how many detectives you think we have right now within the state police, just in your mind? And the answer is, statewide, we have 19. Now, if you're in the rurals, that's kind of important. We do all kinds of things regarding illegal cannabis grow and so on and so forth. Uh, and we follow up and our main mission is to provide services to the counties, particularly where it, when the, the counties that are in need that don't necessarily have that availability to have trained investigators to conduct homicide investigations and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, we also have now some, um, we're getting more involved with cannabis as well as with the uh, uh, pharmacy board and some issues that we're doing with investigations there. So the role has been increasing and increasing. And I remember having a conversation with Governor Sislak one time, uh, saying, well, we're going to be involved with this and this, and who's going to be involved? Division investigation, division investigation, because their mission is so varied. And, the, uh, and I kept saying, and by the way, Governor, we only have, boom, number of people. And by the way, Governor, you know, trying to give them uh, uh, a hint. But we're really in need of having people who can conduct some of these investigations. And, uh, and, and it's getting to the point where we're going to getting involved with critical mass. Um, one other thing I want, I want to mention, if I just get a chance, because uh, I want to get this in here. I don't think we had touched on it with the laboratory. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, Tyler Klimas, who's the executive director of the Cannabis Board and I'm on the advisory commission for the Cannabis Advisory Commission. One of the things we hope to do with the state forensic laboratory, which would be inside the headquarters of the DPS, is to also have part of that for cannabis uh, 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 research, cannabis laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. And I know their plan is to try to have a lab in the north and a lab in the south. Right now, all that's being outsourced. And this would guarantee, again, quality control. It would also, uh, uh, in quality control and uh, purity issues and so on and so forth, to me, is, is critical. I know there was an article in the media, oh, maybe a month or so ago, about how many hundred pounds or thousands, how many thousand pounds uh, of uh, uh, cannabis uh, was distributed. And it turned out it had some sort of uh, either a um, chemical that was sprayed on it or whatever. I think we are desperately in need of a state laboratory, and I think we can, we can 
again, I hate to use these terms, but two birds with one stone, it also will help finance that laboratory and finance the building, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I wanted to bring that in. But the investigative division, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that the illegal grow of cannabis with um, particularly the, the grow that's related to major groups and cartels is occurring in this state as well as in Northern California, and that can't be overlooked. Does that answer a little bit of it? Well, not exactly, but thank you. I, I'm all <laughs> very supportive of the state lab, and I think that's a, a critical component. It didn't really answer what's unique about why we need our state highway patrolmen on the road, um, but we can have that offline. Uh, I think maybe you could share that with the members, some of the uniqueness to the, the state police. The next question I have, and this is the last one, thank you, Madam Chair, is you asked for the new um, motorcycles and new vehicles. Do you have people to drive them? Sherry Brigham for the record, yes, we do. But as I said, um, we don't buy the vehicles until we have mileaged out the vehicles that we have. So um, they do last a little bit longer since we don't have um, as many officers driving them. Plus, um, we do have the crashes that go on with the normal traffic routine, and we lose them that way. But yes, we don't buy them until we need them. Great. Thank you for that. Again, thank all of you in the audience. Uh, and Madam Chair, thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this incredibly depressing uh, presentation. Um, as, as I look through this information, um, I'm wondering, and, and although it was mentioned once or twice about grants, are there any federal grants that the department is currently receiving <clears throat> and or are there other opportunities for us, for us as a state to be able to possibly both um, apply for and then also look into matching grants uh, in this incredibly difficult area? I noticed that there was the, <clears throat> excuse me, onboard trucking one that was that is really important. I think in our state with how much of uh, that open highway is and how people. Every once in a while, I like to speed through it. Uh, but any other grants that you could possibly bring up would be wonderful. Sherry Brighamman, for the record, and I may have Curtis chime in with spe specifics, as I don't recall all of them. But we are largely funded by grants, believe it or not. Um, and then, of course, our highway troopers are funded by Highway Fund, which kind of has a problem because then our PNP officers are general fund and our investigators are general fund. In fact, the investigation division doesn't even get a budget for overtime. We have grants that pay for the overtime. So um, MixApp is the um, 4721, that's the budget account you were talking to, alluding to the trucking carriers. Um, yes, it's very significant and funds a number of officers for that purpose, but is very specific in what we can do with it. Um, OCJA is uh, our division of Office of uh, Criminal Justice Assist Assistance. And their whole goal in life is to find us more grants. So um, we have that continuing and new grants coming up every day. Now, granted, there's four of them, I think four. Um, but they do a phenomenal job of getting that information out to us so that we can apply for those grants as they apply. Um, and then we have the traffic of, uh, the Office of Traffic Safety, and that is also grants, but those grants are from the Highway Safety uh, Plan. And so we get a significant amount of grant um, funding through the Traffic Safety Division, and that funding is, is mostly used to educate um, our, our citizens, you know, you see the commercials come out. Those are sponsored by us. We're also, they are also managing the contract with Brazos, which is the uh, citation system that we were trying to update and change along with AB116. So, oh, yes, yes, yes. We use grants, and we're pretty good at getting them. Um, but most of them are temporary in nature. Most of them will not cover any pay. They'll cover overtime um, if we are using that overtime for the specific purpose that is required in the grant. Uh -huh. 
Thank you very much. And we'll go to Assemblyman Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I have any questions at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll be brief. I know we get, need to be moving along. I just want to reinforce as, along with a comment as much as anything. Uh, you know, we're back to pre-1970. There are no speed limits in rural Nevada. Uh, you know, it's just unfortunate if you are unlucky enough to encounter an officer. But the chances are you can run Highway 50 from Ely to Fallon at 100 miles an hour and not worry about it. Yeah, it's uh, you, it, you're just bad luck if you happen to get caught. Uh, one thing I w I'm kind of reaching into the... <laughs> <laughs> into the next budget a little bit and you know we all get mixed up with this we've got motor carrier compliance and enforcement that's DMV uh, you know senator my colleague there on the end was talking about you know the trucks that's completely different but do you have anything between the departments do you in fact uh, allow does motor carrier in fact will a site for speeding infractions or pull over pull a, someone over say a, a regular passenger car um, Sherry Brigman for the record. Um, yes to yes. Um, these are, in my mind, the way I see it is in California, they have actually specific fixed way sites where the trucks all go and weigh in. That's us. We don't have those. So we carry the scales in the back of the trucks. And so we have um, civilian uh, folks that go out and um, measure, weigh, that sort of thing. And then um, we have a highway patrol trooper as partners that will give out tickets, not only to the trucks, but to civilians who um, are driving in a car um, um, and not in the right place for the truck, not being reasonable in their driving. And I do have more people from Highway Patrol who could probably do a heck of a lot better to explain this. Right. No, like. no, I understand that. I just wanted to make sure. <clears throat> but again, you know, typically you'll see a compliance and enforcement vehicle, which is IE motor carrier. But you're telling me those are actually Nevada State Police. Um, I think we're talking to I'm, yeah, I, I'm afraid that, and I just wanted to try and clarify that, and I didn't want to take a lot of time doing it. Uh, George Tagliati, for the record. Uh, our, a, our commercial troopers are usually drive pickup trucks right. that are marked with highway patrol and have all that gear. We have a subject matter expert here. Uh, James uh, Simpson, for the record. Um, the motor carrier from years ago, we are in our commercial troopers, the compliance, what you're speaking of, I think, is DMV, which is totally separate from us. Um, our commercial troopers, years ago we had them in your area. We had a Land couple out there. And, I know several yes. of them. Um, yes. They stop trucks. They weigh trucks. And to answer what you were asking earlier, that's a federal program, which is very important because in the rural areas and within the entire state, commercial vehicles, Nevada is a route from east coast to west coast, even though we're on the west coast. But I-80, I-15 are major routes to keep the interstate commerce going, to keep this country moving forward. Um, we are that team. The compliance enforcement through the DMV is separate from us. I don't want to speak to what they do, and I think that was one of your questions. But our I was just trying to determine the, se the separation there, but there really isn't any separation as far as enforcement. Uh, but for as far our commercial as troopers, we're all troopers. Like a Marine is a Marine is a Marine. Our troopers are troopers all the way through. Some have other duties. We um, receive funds from the federal government. We're supposed to do about 30,000 inspections a year, which is significant. And our troopers do the best to do them. In the rural areas near area, our regular traffic troopers also perform commercial duties at one point, and we're going to try to get back to there again. Because I, I worked out in Elko. I patrolled your area. And it, sometimes it's scary yeah. driving out there. And I understand the speeds out there, and we do need to do better. And that's what we're trying to do. I, bringing all this together, having our conversations with you guys about our plights, and we're hoping that you guys are understanding with that. Thank you. And I'm not knocking the speed. Uh, li I like getting from there to here. Uh, it's just that we need to understand that it is happening out there. And then I sympathize. Uh, you know, if you have a fatality on, say, Hickerson Summit, that trooper's going to come from Ely or Fallon. It's a 120-mile response. 
And again, I'm not going to knock on the local jurisdictions, uh, you know, the county sheriffs or whatever, but you have to understand there's going to be a little different level of investigation in the expertise if it's a highway patrol trooper there or a deputy sheriff. Yes, sir. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. And from me personally, slow down because I'd like to see you each day. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I would go to uh, Senator Gansert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and we need to make sure he wears a seatbelt, which he does now. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go to the Criminal History rep Repository. So they have some responsibilities around the sex offender registry and also the fingerprint um, background checks. And I wanted to know how the, I, was, I was happy to hear that there's some opera funds that can be used for the update or the installation of the uh, Nevada Criminal Justice Information System, the NCJIS. I wanted to know how that was going because we have so many um, entities like the school districts that require background checks and behavioral health analysts and so forth, and the process is really slow. And I and I also recognize that the FBI won't let you share a background check. So if it's a Department of Ed versus the school district versus a national organization that's gone through background check versus what the state requires, you have to keep doing them. So how is the, uh, that upgrade or modernization going and what do the timelines look like or what should we expect in the future with that modernization? Thank you. Sherry Brighaman, for the record, I want to introduce Erica Souza. She is the Chief of uh, Records Communication and Compliance and I am happy to say that we are on target um, with regard to NCGIS and for the NCGIS modernization. Um, so that's rolling out really well, which will help and reduce time waits. Our issue now is we are not up and running and staffing in our CCD is just as critically low as everywhere else. But I have Erica here who can explain that to you. Thank you, Erica Suzyamas, for the record. I don't really have a whole lot to add from what Deputy Director Bergman just stated. We are on track with the NCGIS modernization. We are set to start rolling out some of the deployment, I think, in the next few months with some of our local agencies. Full rollout is expected to be by June of 2024. Um, th thank you for that response. And also, I want to thank you and all the, the troopers, everyone who works on our behalf to keep us safe. We, we support you, and we want to make sure we get funding to make sure you can keep your troops and all your administrative staff and everybody to run these operations because it's critical for our public safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for the presentation. It certainly sounds like I can, I can see that the need is dire. I can hear that the need is dire. And you made a comment um, at the beginning of your presentation that um, if, if you didn't get the funding you needed to hire the people you need, the association virtually disappear, go away, because you wouldn't have people supporting it. Help me on a big picture, what, what does that mean? Does that mean all of these services would go to the county levels? When you make a comment like that, does that mean it's just spread out? Because it seems to me as a state, we need to provide funding for safety, whether it comes from the state pot or the county pots. And also it seems, I'm sure we have regulations for all of these things that require we maintain certain services. And if we don't, then we also open ourselves up to lawsuits from the citizens. So what, ha what happens if we don't meet that? Where, what would that picture look like in three years? <coughs> The Department of Public Safety has a, an, an interesting mission. I mean, it's, it's so varied. Uh, and so, for example, uh, with our Division of Parole and Probation, uh, we handle all adult parole and probation for folks either being put on parole or getting out of uh, incarceration. Um, the counties handle the juvenile. If, they, if we were to disappear, um, I don't know, you'd have to readjust where all the counties take care of all the adult parole and probation. In the meantime, as those cases start to rise or our numbers start to go down as far as officers who are maintaining contact with these uh, folks, um, you can only imagine based on the statistics and history that uh, the recidivism rate for, for people who are getting out of prison or on uh, uh, probation uh, will increase. 
and crime will rise. Uh, the Highway Patrol, I think, which uh, is, again, uh, a function that's supported by, principally by the federal government, uh, the whole intent was for highways when they first built the first highway, where we would have folks uh, out there to enforce to save lives. I get phone calls from various counties, particularly the rural counties, when we don't have a sufficient coverage, because that means that the county has to provide that coverage. Also, um, we have, uh, so when we're talking about budgets, it once again goes back to, does Peter pay it or does Paul pay it? But uh, the, uh, the structure as it is within the Highway Patrol is again under a federal mandate, federal guidelines, and those fundings, as Sherry mentioned, are, are there to support it. Uh, our Office of Traffic Safety, one of, the, one of my interests and passions over that laboratory is the hope that when we, be, we are the specialists in traffic safety, we, Highway Patrol, when we talk about a laboratory, uh, and a forensic laboratory that can provide information to the Office of Traffic Safety, who can provide information to NHTSA to demonstrate again, why, what is an impaired driver? What are the comorbidity factors in that? Did we just do one of these tests, a visual type of thing and say, I smell a beer and that's it and call it a day? I, I, based on money and finances, that's the expedient way to get somebody off the highway. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of research nationwide. Is it, is someone involved in pharmaceutical drugs? Is it involved in the cannabis? Uh, possibly, considering now we have legalized marijuana and uh, recreational marijuana in this state, we need to take that next step forward because there's a potential with our tourist industry that we're going to have more impaired drivers on the road. What do we do to address it? That's critical. It's not only the bodies that are going to be there to enforce it, it's also are we compiling enough data to give to the Office of Traffic Safety and to the feds so that we have a better understanding of what exactly is the root cause of the problem? Is it more, is it just alcohol or is it something else? Um, and uh, from a self-interest point of view, that also will enhance, I believe, our availability to get more funding and more grants, et cetera, from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, and then I'll, the last question will come from Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what I have is, is not specifically a question, but more of a statement. For those of you that were here in the 2019 legislative session, you'll remember there was a bill that was brought before this legislative body to address the situation because we saw the problem coming. And there were members who didn't vote for the pay increase for our public safety individuals. And as someone who formerly worked in public safety, we have a responsibility as a state to keep our constituents safe. And that means paying our law enforcement professionals at a rate that they deserve and a competitive rate so that we can keep them. If we do not have a highway patrol, if we do not have state PMP, we are not doing our job as legislators for this state and for our constituents. And we are putting that responsibility onto our local municipalities and our counties. And we're gonna be paying for it one way or another because then they're gonna be sitting in those chairs asking for the dollars to do the job that we're supposed to do. So if we're serious about keeping this community safe, then I ask all of you, look at our budget, find the dollars to do what we should have done in 2019 so we wouldn't be here. Thank you very much. And Assemblyman O'Neill, if you'll keep it short and to the point, we're running behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate the time. I'd like to reinforce what Co-Chair just said in support of our State Department of Public Safety. But I do have two questions. I actually, if I also may say, when I worked for the DPS Investigation Division, we had over 100 investigators for the state. And that wasn't as old as I am. I'm not talking 50 years ago. I'm talking a short 15 years ago. 100, over 100, I think the exact number was 109 uh, across the state. It's embarrassing that we have the largest, have a state agency 
that does not have a presence in our largest city slash county being Las Vegas, Clark County. And as our chair said, we need to step up to the plate. But with that, on recruitment, when you go to recruit veterans, it's every DOD agency, master at arms, military police, uh, security police, the Air Force, they all have their own police agencies. When they come, if they'd like to come to work for DPS, are they have to start academy from the basics or are they in lateral? Eligible for the lateral. Sherry Brigham in for the record. Um, it really comes down to the lateral status with post. So um, if they have already met post requirements and either are or it's transferable to post, which is an opportunity, then they would not have the same requirements as somebody who is just learning law enforcement from the beginning. Um, but I don't know what those requirements might be. We'd have to look into it. If, and someone may have, but I don't have anybody from HR here, do I? Let me just jump in a second. Okay. I'll just, uh, I'd strongly suggest yeah. that we look at that because I do know that they are taking the same classes that our civilian officers in, in civilian law enforcement agencies are uh, taking now. Uh, uh, George Tagliati for the record. Um, to address that post uh, police officer standards and training, in fact, they're meeting uh, next week we have a meeting, uh, is looking at that lateral um, policies. So it would be police officers from other states. And you have to qualify in a certain standard for every law enforcement officer within the state of Nevada that you have to qualify at a certain level to be a category one, which would be highway patrol, PMP, uh, Washoe County sheriffs, et cetera. Um, and then there's categories twos and threes. Uh, th that standard and the question of are we hurting ourselves by not opening that up where people have to start fresh and you have to go right in the academy with all the rookies when you do have some experience, be it in the military or not? My personal belief right now is there is no lateral program for military. You would have to start from day one. But uh, this is something that, again, POST is looking at because of the need in law enforcement overall for all the agencies that are, that are struggling to keep their numbers up. That's disappointing. I would like to hear more from Post on that. The other question I had, if I may, Chair, we're short personnel. Have we looked at any IT uh, solutions out there? We used to have, I know, an aeronautical unit that covered and it was a, equal to so many troopers. The airplane was covering the uh, rural highways. Uh, are we looking at anything there, too, to supplant uh, uh, our shortages? Well, George Tagliati, for the record, one thing we've been toying with is the idea of trying to, uh, again, based on some financial restrictions, et cetera, et cetera, is to form maybe a, a civil air patrol type unit where we could get pilots uh, in certain areas, particularly in the north and the rural areas, who we could engage uh, to assist us to cover some highway areas, rather than having a trooper drive 50 to 100 miles to get there and find out there's nothing there and then turn around and come back and et cetera. And you can just imagine the, the effort that takes place there. If we could maybe get a group of volunteers like Civil Air Patrol uh, that we could have to do that and possibly just provide the fuel. If these are recreational pilots, I'm having been a pilot myself, go out on a weekend, it gives you something to do. And it's kind of, uh, if we can also do it, some service for the state. So that, that's one of the projects we're looking at, but we don't have anything in our budget. The uh, aircraft that we had with the Highway Patrol were sold some years ago. Sherry is uh, uh, more familiar with why and what to that. I was thinking just of drones or something along that line. I do appreciate it. I thank you. For one last thing. For uh, Senator Titus, maybe we could do a mounted unit horse mounted unit to uh, take care of her uh, family members. But anyways, thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair, thank for the you time. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to close this part of the presentation. Thank you both for being there, here and, and there on the roads. Thanks to all of you. Um, it's no secret that I have law enforcement in the family, and so um, I keep track of where you are and what you're doing. And I thank each and every one of you for your job and what you do to keep our Nevada roads safe. 
Thank you very much, Director and uh, Ms. Brueggemann. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you know where we all live for the next few months. If you have questions, concerns, or would like to speak with any of us, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're shifting to agenda item five, Department of Motor Vehicles. Thank you for your patience as we discussed that subject before you. Director Julie Butler, so good to see you. Um, and you are here with your team to give a presentation for the department. And um, please, when you are ready, uh, go ahead. Okay, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Julie Butler, Director, Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles. And with me today is Sean Sever, our legislative liaison. I'm pleased to present to you an overview of the department's 24-25 budget. Next slide. DMV has a new vision and mission statement to reflect our current direction to move most of our services online. Our vision is to be a nat national leader in DMV services, and our mission is to provide efficient motor vehicle solutions for the identification, licensure, and protection of all we serve. Next slide, please. The department is comprised of seven divisions supported by the director's office. There are 1,289 authorized positions and 18 field offices statewide. We also partner with county assessors and AAA for vehicle registration transactions. There are 46 kiosk locations statewide that are not shown on the map. We conduct roughly 5 million financial transactions annually, and most transactions require an appointment in our metro offices. The department recently undertook a strategic planning exercise to inform our path and decisions over the next five years. The DMV transformation effort remains a top priority to move the department toward meeting those goals. The department has a dedicated leadership team of experienced professionals on its executive leadership team, as, as shown on the next two slides. Okay. The DMV is funded primarily through highway fund appropriations and the fees that it collects on various services such as driver's license, vehicle registrations, and titles. We receive a very small general fund appropriation each year for the costs associated with the automatic voter registration program. We collect in excess of $1.7 billion in revenue each fiscal year. Per statute, highway fund appropriations for the department's operations must stay under 22% of the funds collected and distributed to the highway fund, excluding fuel tax revenue. Currently, the cap is at 27% to account for the DMV transformation effort. So let's talk about where we distribute that funding. About 38% of our revenues go to counties and school districts and 36% goes to the highway fund. The remainder goes to support the department's operations and to the general fund. The department forecasts revenues in December of even-numbered years and in March of odd-numbered years. These revenue forecasts are used by policymakers to help balance the governor's recommended budget and later to balance the overall state budget that the legislature approves. Revenues dipped during the pandemic but have since come back strong. DMV is forecasting average overall revenue growth per fiscal years 23, 24, and 25 of 2.32% and average highway fund growth re revenue growth per year of 2.27%. The department will continue to monitor revenues throughout the budget build and refine projections based on current trends. The department has submitted a lean budget for the next two fiscal years. Our primary focus remains the DMV transformation effort, or DTE, which was funded in the current biennium as a nearly $115 million program over four fiscal years to digitize the DMV and move most services online. The department worked with Mission Critical Partners, formerly MTG Management Consultants, on a roadmap that breaks the DTE into six major work initiatives over the life of the program. 
There are currently over 120 people and 12 vendor partners dedicated to the DTE. During fiscal year 22, the department updated its website to make it mobile friendly and ADA compliant. We hired needed staff and contractors, onboarded some of the solution vendors, vetted requirements for additional system components, and started replacement of the Compliance Enforcement Division's case management system, which is urgent due to the expiration of their existing case management system contract in June 2023. The department will go live with the new case management system in March 2023. In December 2022, we launched a chat bot on the department's website, which guides customers through routine transactions, such as scheduling an appointment, without having to call or email the DMV. A Spanish version of the chatbot was rec recently launched. Based on the California DMV's experience with its chatbot, we anticipate the bot can divert approximately 30% of phone calls from the DMV call center. Yesterday, we launched a pilot program with select Nevada franchise auto dealers to allow them to submit vehicle sales documents electronically to the department rather than through the mail. Mailing sales documents back, back and forth has contributed to lengthy delays in processing vehicle titles. We will run the pilot for about 30 days, see if we need to make any changes, and then expand this other functionality to franchise auto dealers, to other franchise auto dealers. For the rest of FY23, we will focus on obtaining remaining system components, including the content and document management solutions, while aligning with the DTE roadmap. We will solidify our plans for data migration, integration with partner software solutions, and a cloud data storage approach. Simultaneously, we will work on improvements for the DMV call center to enhance staff's ability to take and respond to phone calls and emails from the public. We are asking for approximately 10.7 million in FY24 and 7.7 million in FY25 to continue the DTE program. We will implement the financial management system and content and document management solutions and continue with data migration, data storage, and partner integrations, which will be the biggest and most complex portion of the program. Additional service, services will continue to be moved online throughout the next biennium as we undertake these initiatives. While all that is going on, Decision Unit E228 in the Motor Vehicle IT Division requests funding for $840,000 per fiscal year for contractor support to maintain the DMV legacy system, which is called CARS, while existing staff are learning the new IT environment. The DMV will be running parallel IT systems through the transformation effort. It's a significant pivot for current staff to learn the new cloud-based technologies and become proficient. They need to devote their full time and attention to this task, and the only way to do that is to hire contractors to focus on maintaining the existing legacy environment. Without this decision unit, the department's chances of success in implementing the DTE are significantly diminished. Decision Unit E242 in the records budget account requests funding to, address, uh, to replace our address verification software. And E232 in the NV Live budget account requests funding for a software solution to replace the in-house vehicle liability insurance verification system. Those existing solutions were built to run on the CARS platform and they won't work in the new DMV, in the transform DMV environment. Our other uh, major focus over the biennium is to ensure our continuity of operations and improved communication statewide. To that end, the Move It division has requested the following enhancements. E226 requests funding for a SolarWinds Orion log analyzer. Today, our information security officer does not have the ability to monitor and audit IT system logs. Everything is manual. This leaves the department without a critical tool in information security hygiene to record and discover information security problems. A log analyzer will provide vital information about the department's network security to include such information as who is accessing our systems and when, if any endpoints appear to be vulnerable, and if there are suspicious anomalies or events that need to be mitigated in real time. E551 requests funding for uh, VM software, VMware, VM Sphere software licenses for five locations. At our larger metro offices, physical servers are employed to provide business critical services to those sites. Instead of purchasing multiple separate physical servers, this request would virtualize those servers to run on one beefier server at each location, leveraging the software. Additionally, virtualization provides a high degree of availability, greater expansion potential, improved protection, and monitoring under one management platform. E554 requests funding to replace video conferencing equipment that is end of life in four DMV locations. 
Video conferencing equipment in this, these locations are more than eight years old and replacement parts are hard to get. This equipment is critical to our ability to communicate inter-office and it will be especially important as we continue the DMV transformation effort. NE715 requests a one-shot appropriation in fiscal year 24 to replace end-of-life switches at various offices. These charts show the department's funding breakout uh, for our 24-25 budget. As you can see, highway funds and fees collectively make up about 75% of the budget for FY24 and 76% in FY25. So I talked about the cap a little bit earlier. Pleased to report that the department's 24-25 budget request comes in well below the 27% cap, with approximately $36 million to spare in FY24 and $45 million in FY25. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the department's plans for a new office in Henderson, located off Interstate 15 and Silverado Ranch Boulevard, which is part of the department's capital improvement project, or CIP, request. This project is the continuation of CIP 21-P06 for the construction of a full-service DMV facility with commercial driver's license and emission services. The existing Henderson office was built in 1997. The property on which the facility is located does not allow the potential for growth. The parking lot is too small, which causes customer and staff frustration. Practically speaking, my staff can't even take a lunch break because when they come back, they're not going to have a parking spot. Parking, um, the customer counters are not ADA compliant, and they were built when there was a lot less electronic equipment used by staff to conduct transactions. Due to the lobby shape, I've got customers walking over each other to get from one end of the lobby to the other, which is stressful for them and stressful for our staff. Other areas of the building, such as staff and customer restrooms, offices, lighting, and the staff break room need extensive refurbishment. The UNLV Center for Business and Economic Research provided these statistics on Clark County's growth. The Clark County population when the Henderson DMV opened in 1997 was 1.1 million people. The projected population of Clark County in 2030 is 2.7 million, which is more than double the population when the building was first constructed. Our Donovan Express Commercial Driver's License Facility was built in 1995. It's in an industrial area of North Las Vegas off Craig Road, and our customers complain about poor access to the site. And it's goofy to get to. You've got to get off the freeway, and you've got to do a U-turn, and then you've got to get in there, and, and it's, it's, it's weird. Anyway, uh, due to population growth, the facility cannot accommodate the increase of walk-in customers, and lines routinely form outside the building, and, and tempers flare as the temperatures goes, go up. Yeah. I'm sure you've all experienced that. Uh, the classroom for the third-party training program, which is required under federal regulations, is too small, with barely enough room for the three staff, let alone the six to eight people uh, that are taking the classes at a time. Restrooms, offices, customer counters, and staff break room need extensive remodeling. The site is located adjacent to the railroad tracks, and there have been numerous acts of vandalism, homeless encampments, and evidence of illegal drug use around the perimeter of the building, leading to concerns for staff and customer safety. So this is a rendering of the new Silverado Ranch property. The plan is to, be real, uh, to build a combined DMV emissions and commercial driver's license facility at the new location and decommission the existing Henderson and Donovan CDL facilities, which is what we did when we built the new South Reno DMV. And actually, the building plans are going to be based on the design of the South Reno DMV. The site is located on a 20-acre property that's leased through state lands from the Bureau of Land Management. It's easily accessible via Interstate 15, making it ideal for non-commercial and commercial customers alike. The new service center will alleviate the previous staff and customer parking issues, and it will be a safer and more secure facility for all. <clears throat> if the project is approved by the 2023 legislature, the Public Works Board is aiming to start construction in July 2024, with a facility opening in July 2026. And that's it for my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And we do have a question from Senator Gokachia. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we stood it up, I believe, last session, or at least you stood up. You were, had a like a roving uh, driver's license team that was going to go to West Wendover, and then we looked at uh, expanding it maybe maybe to some other areas of the state uh, to issue driver's license. They were going to be mobile. Uh, I know then we got the pandemic. I was just wondering, is that still in the queue? 
Um, thank you for the question. Julie Butler, for the record, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Guaycachia. Um, no, that, that uh, we never did establish the roving DL team. What we did do is put a kiosk out in West Wendover. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, we put a kiosk out there. And so there are no plans right now to reestablish that mobile DL team. Uh, yeah, and uh, so there is no plans for that. Maybe we could look at that in the future. As you look at this map, you know, it's tough to get a driver's license in rural Nevada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Senator Titus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the uh, opportunity to ask a question. Good to see you, Mr. Seaver. Uh, wondering, you know, my question is going to be, what, what's our current balance and how much have you paid out in the money reimbursement for those tech fees? And it's my understanding that it reverts back to the general fund at X time. Could you just clarify that? Um, Julie Butler, again, for the record, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Titus. So um, right now, we have distributed $2,192,536 to 61,005 businesses. And uh, approximately 74% of those checks have cleared so far. We have issued 73,862 customer refunds uh, at a total of $219,437, and that is uh, five and three quarter percent of the 3.8 million available. So uh, grand total through um, January 31st of this year is $1,837,200, uh, $1,837,000, uh, speak, <laughs> uh, which is approximately 30% uh, of the available funding. And when does it revert back to the general fund? Um, in um, September of 2023 is when this So this goes. And that's, that it goes back to the general fund, correct? Not, or is there um, The highway fund. The highway fund. Okay, great. Second question, if I might, Madam Chair. Um, what, when um, you get back the voter registration cards, what do you do with them? But the non delivery could you send out a card to, to voter registration when somebody's registered, right? The voters then get a card. If they do they come back to you if it's non deliverable? Uh, stand by one, please. Okay, sorry, I had to phone a friend there. Um, Julie Butler, for the record, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Titus. Um, those cards, uh, if they come back as undeliverable, staff shreds them. All right, so my concern, and this isn't, I'm not going about voter registration. What I'm going about is address verification. So when somebody comes and registers, gets a license, get you know, registers their car, um, wouldn't you want to have an accurate address for that if there's an accident involving them, insurance issues, public safety that we just heard that we don't have enough officers. So if there's no, if there's, you know, I, I'm just concerned about that because I'm hearing that, you know, they come back to you, you shred them, but then you don't have accurate information where the person lives or if their driver's license is accurate and anything you do about that or their registration is just, you, you don't, it doesn't matter? Um, thank you for the question, Julie Butler, for the record, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Titus. Um, we would love to have our addresses be accurate, um, you know, but we, um, it's not all up to us, right? As, you know, if you move across town, it's incumbent on the individual to update their address with the department, and they don't always do that. And, you know, unfortunately, there's no, um, it's no really double check with, with SOS, with, uh, with uh, Department of Health and Human Services, with anything. The only time that we, per the federal statute, can update your address is when you are in there doing a covered transaction. So, um, so I'd, I'd love it if, you know, there was some way that, you know, we had the staff to make sure that, you know, as soon as you move, um, you, add, you know, we get your address updated. And unfortunately, it, you know, we're relying on the public's cooperation with that uh, as much as anything. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the information. Thank you very much. Additional questions from the committee? Oh, sorry, Senator Neal, I did not see your hand. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a rural part of my district. They're mostly seniors. Um, and the most recent um, 
meeting that we had, they talked about DMV and they talked about how you've gone online and that not all services are, they're able to actually complete online. And so they'll get there and then they're told, you don't have an appointment, you need to leave. And they're like, what happened to just, you know, some of the impromptu services where you actually are going to show up, you're 75, you need to go in and get something done. And they're, you know, you've met 75 year old. No offense on seniors. On yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying they, they're, they are paper pushers and they're not online. They, if they can physically talk to you or talk to you on the phone, that is their 100% goal. And anything less than that is a problem. And so how are we managing that, right? We have to have some flexibility. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, thank you for that. Julie Butler for the record, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Neal. Um, we, we went to an appointment only model because I don't have the bodies. I don't have the bodies because we're not paying our people. And so um, I don't have the staff to do walk-ins and appointments. And so, um, you know, while, while I am sympathetic and while we do our best to accommodate those folks, um, that's the reality of what we're dealing with, you know, and I, I um, we do, we do know, and, you know, and I, and I know, um, you know, probably one of the questions that, that might come up was why are you asking for this huge new building when you're trying to push all these transactions online? We know there is a certain segment of the population that prefers that face-to-face -face interaction, that no matter how many transactions we put online, um, there's going to be those that want to walk in the building, and the facilities need to be available for them to do so. Also, uh, you know, you can't put all transactions online, right? I mean, you know, you're going to take your driver's exam online, right? So, you know, there's certain things that we're going to have to have a, a facility there. Um, it's a balancing act. So, you know, there, there are certain transactions that, that we still do accept for walk-ins. Um, you can surrender a plate. You can pay a bad debt. Um, we do make, try to make accommodations for, like, military personnel or, you know, somebody uh, it definitely when it comes uh, time for elections and people need an ID to vote. But, um, you know, we do make exceptions and allow those walk-ins. But, you know, by and large, um, we are transitioning to this online model. And, and I will say, um, you know, a, a point of pride and, and a shout out to, to uh, my 77-year-old mother who just renewed her vehicle registration online and said it was so easy. Um, so I think there's hope um, for, the, for the senior community. <laughs> Sure, and Sean, uh, Mr. Sever. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, Sean Sever from the yes. DMV. We also allow uh, walk-ins in our urban offices on Saturdays, and uh, uh, residents can also come in during the week if they don't have an appointment and make an appointment at the door. And I'd just like to give a shout out to Mr. Sever who takes all the legislative panic calls and thank you very much for being that liaison. That's a, that's a really important piece. Um, I believe Senator Harris has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think Mr. Sever may have addressed it. I was wondering, let's just say I only have internet access on my mobile phone or um, I don't have internet access at all. <laughs> I wanted to know if there was some way for me to still make this mandatory appointment um, without being able to go online. It sounds like folks, at least in the urban areas, can come in in person to then make an appointment to come back. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And do we know how accessible or have we focused on what the mobile version of the website looks like to ensure that it's compatible and usable? Because again, there are quite a few people who just rely on that, you know, 4G on their phone uh, to get things done. And if the website is wonky, it's almost not non-existent. Um, Julie Butler, for the record, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Harris. Um, that is one of the the, um, the awesome things about our new website upgrade uh, that we recently did uh, last year is it is mobile compatible and um, compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and so we're, we're pretty proud of that. Thank you so much, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I would tell you the 
new website, which I was on yesterday, is Biney Dice. So thank you. All right, any additional questions, statements? One for the road, okay, there we go. Thank you so much for being concise. And uh, once again, thank you for uh, your team being here. Um, we know that sometimes um, you're in the line of fire and we recognize all your hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, with that, um, we are actually somehow running ahead of schedule today. So with that being said, we will break for lunch, catch up, and whatever else you have to do that's not catch up, that's catch up. And um, we will see you back here at one o'clock for the Department of Transportation. Thank you very much.
It's one o'clock. You told me to be back at one. Gavel in, and they'll come in. If you're listening, we're getting to get started, so make your way to the room. You know, I'm having trouble with this today. <laughs> Welcome, Department of Transportation. I'll bring the subcommittee back to order. I hope you all had a good lunch, and the next item is our Department of Transportation, and they are ready for us. Director Tracy Lark Larkin Thomason and her team are ready to present, so please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Again, I am Tracy Larkin Thomason, the director for the Nevada Department of Transportation. And here with me, I'd like to introduce at the end, I have Jeff LaRude, who is our deputy director for operations. And next to me is Darren Tedford, who is our deputy director for project delivery. And to my right is my strong and sturdy assistant director for finance, for actually administration. And in Las Vegas, I also have Natalie Lieb, who's with Budget, and also we have with us Ashish Bala, who is the Executive Director for the State Infrastructure Bank. And I'm going to apologize a little bit in advance. This is day 12. It's not meant to be an excuse, <laughs> but I might have to turn over a couple of the questions. But that's why I have the experts We with totally me. understand. It's okay. <laughs> Phone a friend is allowed. All right. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, I'll look at this side. So basically going over the leadership team, you'll see that, of course, as a director, we have three assistant, uh, three deputy directors, two of which I've already introduced. We also have Cole Mortensen, who is our deputy director um, and also state engineer. And then we have four assistant directors. Uh, Felicia, you've met. Also, um, Sandra Rosenberg for planning. I'm sorry, I'm going down through my offices. Um, Jenica Keller for uh, um, operations. Sajid for um, engineering. And then also the next slide, please. I should say we do have nearly nine, um, 1,900 people when fully staffed, and we are gonna talk because we do have about 400 vacancies. We are at about 20 per six vacancy rate on there. Um, on slide three, this is our missions and goal. I'm not gonna read through them. I'm sure you've seen them many times. It is in the front of many, much of the literature you're gonna get. But I did wanna state that I Director, could I ask you to pause for just a minute? Sure. BPS Sorry. is asking us to pause just for a minute for the recording. I can always start over and get it right this time. <laughs> Stay tuned, hang on. Okay, I think we're back up and running. Thank you, go ahead, apologies. All right, again, Tracy Larkin Thomason, uh, the director of um, NDOT. Um, we were on slide three, so we were talking about um, our missions and goal, and I said I will not read them to you, but uh, you will see them many times. Um, but I do want to make a little kind of a spiel on here short, is that I really do believe transportation is fundamental to every other aspect of life. Um, whether you're, the minute you leave the house, basically you're using transportation, sidewalk, bus, scooter, um, along those lines. But I also, it's a Harvard study has proven that lack of reliable transportation is the greatest barrier to economic vitality and also just the advancement of coming out of it, going up economically in the class, I, I hate to say class system, but basically moving up the ladder. Um, and also I have referenced a lot about infrastructure and on there, but it's also the services we provide. So I will go on to number four, the department overview. 
and basically we have 5,354 center lane miles, and that's just measuring the center of it. There's over 13,000 of miles, which means if you have a four lane highway, you multiply that center line by four. Uh, we have 1,238 bridges, and uh, I do wanna say that one area where we are truly excellent is we have been number one on bridges in the nation for the past eight years. So the condition of feel safe any, one, any bridge you cross. 50% um, of the Nevada roads are on the state system but carry about 50% uh, of all vehicle traffic, 70% of truck traffic, and 68% of heavy uh, truck traffic. On slide five. The department is divided into three districts. You have in the northeast, where you're located at is District 2. Uh, basically, Reno Tau goes out to a little past Lovelock to um, Rye Patch, and then across the Tahoe Basin and goes down through Hawthorne. District 1 is Las Vegas, and it goes up to Tonopah. And then in the northeast, we have Elko, which covers Winnemucca, um, Ely, and the um, Elko, of course. In between there, we have a number of maintenance stations throughout the state, substations where they to basically cover all the rural areas. So we have a little over, I think it's 50, uh, 42 different maintenance stations in the state. On slide six, contributing to Nevada's economy. So basically, uh, we talk about job years, and I wanna explain that a job year is simply one job for every year. So to estimate Nevada's impact on the economy for every $76,293 spent on a project or a capital outlay program equals one year. And that source is for the Council of Economic Advisors Guidance and Transportation Infrastructure spending. And we drop these jobs into three categories. So first we have the direct jobs. That's the jobs created when we actually put out a project, so a government-sponsored project. Indirect jobs, which are the jobs created for suppliers um, who make the materials and use the um, project. And then the last one is induced job. Basically, as we have jobs for the first one, you then have create more um, uh, I'm trying to think the right word, I'm sorry. But they have more discretionary funds where they can spend and that helps the economy around there. So going out and moving on restaurants and so on. So it's the next slide. We wanna talk about major projects in 2024 and 25. Uh, in Southern Nevada, we have the Henderson Interchange with a current estimate of 350 million. Design build slated to go out in the RFP later on this year in the fall of this year. In Northern Nevada, one of the largest ones is the US 395 McCarran to Golden Valley structure, 170 million, and that design build, bid build is scheduled to advertise uh, in the third quarter. In rural, Nef and then in I-80 on the Humboldt and Churchill counties, these are two projects that's gonna be about 48 million, and then of course we have Brightline, the rail train, which is, while we are overseeing the project, that is not using highway funding. That is fully, um, funded elsewhere, but we are the, we are the person who, the, we are the entity who will be submitting the grant, which is due March 1st, so later on this month. So on the next one, we utilize the highway user fees, federal aid, and for 2024 only per Governor Lombardo's recommended budget, the general fund authorization to fund approximately 99% of the operations. With the governor's recommended budget, you will see that replaced an estimated 250.9 million of highway fund with general funds in order to show the governor's tax initiative. That's basically 250 on the gas tax initiative and 6.9 is the general fund that we normally have for the radio system upgrade. The Federal Aid Highway Program is a reimbursable program and it's required on upfront expenditure of highway funds. And due to the high percentage of federal funds in our state, most FHW requires require only a 5% match. And this is as opposed to 20% match in most states. So we got really pretty good bang for our state dollar on the federal match. Um, federal aid revenue figures reflect an increased amount of reimbursement due to the passage of the Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, also just known as Bill. Um, which increased federal aid apportionment to Nevada by approximately 20% in federal fiscal year 2022 and 2% each federal fiscal year thereafter. Um, this has been a, certainly a welcome part. I do wanna do a little bit of a cautionary note is that that is also eaten up by a lot of inflation. So while we showed about an 18 to 20% increase on this year, there has been a, over a 20% increase in construction costs just through inflation. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 
for fiscal 2024, NDOT is requesting authorization to sell bonds in the amount of $150 million, $100 million to be paid with state fuel tax, and $50 million with fuel revenue indexing. Do note that we do not exceed the two times cap of the highway fund in uh, FY, FY23. And then let's see, next slide. The department has seven enhancement decision units to discuss. Well, basically six enhancement ones. The last one shown is a one-shot. That's the E380 radio is a one-shot apportionment of 29.7 million in 2024. And that's the upgrade to the radio system that is also used by law enforcement, first responders, and so on. So we'll talk, we will reference it a little bit later in another slide. In slide, next slide. With the uh, replacing of equipment, we are requesting 20.4 million in both fiscal year 2024 and 2025. This is with the current rate of inflation, the equipment costs are increasing about 20% each year. So even ones going out that we've ordered, there are times when we have to pay more before they're actually delivered. Um, we are having to failure to effectively replace our equipment impacts the mission of our team members. But I also want to say 48% of our fleet meets the condition criteria for replacement, which means only 52, which means 52% is overdue for replacement. We are, and I, I hate to kind of admit this, but we are last in the nation by far in the condition of our fleet. So we're showing, like I said, about 48% meeting the condition criteria. Most states' best practices should be eight to 10%. So that is a huge difference. Um, and then the next slide, um, we're just talking about new equipment, and that um, is the operational equipment. So that is a replacement of computers, furniture, testing equipment, um, just the kind of the normal things that go around. Using the wrong thing. We also have a ride van with instruments for just a little under a million dollars. That is required to gather information around the state for federal reporting requirements. So there's a number of things. They literally drive around the state. They do LIDAR. They do all things. They measure signals, lane widths, sidewalks, basically an inventory that is then reported to the, to the, um, the federal thing. And that's how we actually work towards some of the federal apportionment. Um, apportionment. That's part of the reporting structure for that. And then another five million for non-rental equipment. Those are tools and other miscellaneous things, just kind of everyday replacements. On the next slide, um, we do say again, all equipment is li that listed is vital to our transportation system and certainly to our operations. Uh, the survey equipment, the new GPS systems replace existing outdated equipment, and it's currently unable to perform the needed, the needed processes without addition to the existing equipment. Um, also, the underbridge uh, truck, these things are not cheap, I mean, by any stretch. But it's over like $1.2 million. Please note that NDOT is required, as every state is required, to inspect uh, all public bridges every two years. And that is also, um, that goes in the inventory, and that's how we rate that we become number one. But it is identifying early on if there's any deficiencies. The truck-mounted culvert cleaner, um, that is definitely something, um, particularly as we get storms, we get fires and other things, we want to keep those clear so that we can address stormwater issues and be, so that doesn't back up and we don't get other um, concerns with that. Those go around the state. As a matter of fact, we have some emergency contracts going on it currently in northern Nevada here because of the amount of snow and the runoff that's coming out. So making sure that we get all the debris and things out of the culverts and moving it forward. Um, dozers, $400, um, the purchase of those, we have uh, over half of our dozers need to be replaced around the state. We're going to talk a little bit more about those later, but basically between uh, the dozers and the, uh, what's the other piece of equipment? Loaders. Pardon? Loaders. Pardon? Loaders. Loaders, I'm sorry. Dozers and loaders. <laughs> I need a kid with a little toy so I can remember those. Um, Actually, there's a saving of over $720,000 per year by having purchasing them as opposed to renting them. And that's per biennium. That's not like in, during the lifetime. That is every two years. On the next slide, the maintenance of buildings and grounds. 
Um, obviously, it's important to uh, have appropriate working spaces, protection of equipment, and make sure that we're standing up to environmental criteria, stormwater criteria. So some of the things that we're looking at in District 1, we're doing the Washington Street uh, rehabilitation. If any of you are familiar with our yard in the south, there's a number of um, deficiencies that we need to look around, not only in the buildings themselves, but also in looking at remediation on some groundwater, fuel, et cetera. Um, we have an assurance lab in Las Vegas, 3.1, uh, construction of sprung structures in Mina, Montgomery Pass, and Panaca, uh, and a new administrative building also at the Washington structure. That thing is decades old, um, literally built, I think, in the early 40s. So. Uh, District 2, there's some uh, improvement at the Gladi DMV building. There's a rehab of the Virginia City Maintenance Station. Uh, the design for the new Lovelock station, the Gazek system replacement, that's the avalanche control system around Lake Tahoe, um, and then uh, moving, so putting some brine equipment around different, more strategically around the north. That's part of the things that actually we use as mitigation with any snow coming in and weather related. Um, then in District 3, uh, wash rack, that's also again just with environmental protection of the yard. Uh, designed for the new Elko administrative building and taking, replacing some failed retaining walls and a Quinn Weber, the bay extension designs. Some of the older buildings, they cannot accommodate the equipment any longer. They simply don't have the length. On the next slide for um, new positions. Um, as a transfer system to go, additional positions are required to require the effectively, and it also is needed to do some of the changing type of job work we're doing, such as there's more IT positions, there's more thing with ITS, as opposed to some of the more traditional positions that we request. We are requesting 50 positions, that's 12 in administration, 10 in engineering, 9 construction, 17 IT, and 1 pilot. We, um, the pilot one is to make sure that we can effectively keep the planes up and going and also meet some of the, address some of the limitations we have on what they, how long they can fly, that type of um, parameters. The rest area initiative, and we can certainly, we have, of course, if you want a breakdown of the very specific of what those um, uh, positions are, we have that, of course, listed. For, slide, um, for the rest area initiative, Many of those that were actually built in the 1970s, 1977, we are looking at replacing three of them. Uh, and starting that is a Trinity, Biwawi, and Miller. Um, a Trinity station, if you know where that is, it's I-80 and it goes down, headed down to Fallon. It gets over use of about 179,000 stops a year. Second in the number one, Biwawi is about 136,000. So these are very needed. Um, they're very strategically placed and very well used. Um, so let's see. On the next system, the fueling system. This is something that we started in 2015 and 2017 to start to replace the, basically the fuel pumps were failing with, around the state. So we started with replacement. We are considerably done with it. We have, I think 26 are complete. We have three more going out this year. And then we have 15 left that just need to be um, just have upgrades instead of full re replacement. And please note that these fueling stations, we have 5,000 card users that use them. So it's not just end out. As a matter of fact, we, of all the users there, we are the least ones that use that system. It's mainly law enforcement, uh, some of the school system, it is first responders, and in any emergency situation, it is usually set up and we, we address the, the needs depending on what the emergency is. But it is, uh, it's actually very vital. A lot of this also included replacing when we went on the sites, the underground tanks, um, looking to make sure that there was no leakage and all those as they addressed. Like I said, I'm pleased to say that it is almost done or we've made considerable progress, but I'll be very happy when they are done. And it was also staggered specifically so that when they end of, end of its life cycle this time, we don't again hit where it all fails at once across the system. Um, and the next one we have in the radio system replacement, we have the Nevada Shared Radio System um, for ongoing operations and emergency response. This was a project um, that is a public-private partnership with NV Energy and Washoe County. It is statewide. Um, it is also, um, it is complex due to the required technology and the site locations because a lot of them are remote uh, mountaintops with difficult 
terrain. What we are showing on here is only our portion of what the overall one. I think the overall one was 63 point, I'm sorry, I can't read it. Our portion is 69. Our portion is 69 million, and the total project was? Uh, about three times that. Okay, so we're praying for about a third of it. Here's where you're showing where I haven't had quite enough time to assimilate all the data. <laughs> um, and the next slide. Um, Oh, I, I actually, one other point was on there. It's part of the thing on the radio system that has delayed it. There have been supply chain issues, and um, COVID-19 also just affected the progress of it. So now we're going to talk a little bit of some of our critical issues. Um, primarily, the, one of the biggest one is inflation. The cost has gone up significantly, and we're not seeing anything that's going to be dropping. So we're looking at um, asphalt being about 19%. And then diesel fuel is about 33%. Um, and then also even equipment is up 20%, as mentioned earlier. So there are some of the limited availability along with, the, like I said, the supply chain is just driving it up. And when I say supply chain challenges, there's because often many now we have on a lot of our projects that are already out there, there are delays and there are requests for delays from the contractors because they're having what used to be a two month lead time is now a six to eight month lead time in getting them. And those are particularly things like signal poles and other um, critical parts to it. Um, on position vacancy, um, we are high. I mean, this is definitely a critical issue for us. The average part is 26, but when you actually get out in the field and you're talking maintenance, we are averaging 50 to 75% vacancy rates and the maintenance part. And just frankly, it's due to um, pay. That's just the pay part on there. The majority of one we have done some studies on there, it, in a lot of those areas, we are showing up to 42% discrepancy with the surrounding part. And I, I know this isn't anything that you guys haven't heard before, but it's definitely starting to affect us in a real, very real manner. Um, so uh, we've talked about the vacancy rate and what that has done to, um, it just shows there the full-time position vacancy. So we've gone up, up to a 407 right now as a current one as of last week. I think this slide just says it. Uh, beyond that, then the high cost, just, we would just want to emphasize that what that does mean is as it moves forward, it does affect some of the mission of it, that there are times when they're working overtime in these last snowstorms, you know, while we still maintain the, the mandates on how long they can work and so on. We are literally had a few snow plows that were not out there because we did not have drivers to put in them. And those are the concerns that I'm worried about is some of the more critical aspect because many times our People are the first responders. They are the first ones on the, the site, and that's across the state. And that concludes that concludes my presentation. Except I now would like to turn it over to Ashish Bala, who is in Southern Nevada. And as I mentioned before, he's the executive director of the State Infrastructure Bank. Thank you. Go ahead, please, when you're ready. Is your microphone on? Push the, push, push the mic button. He's right in front of me. Is it, if it's lit, let, go ahead and let me see if I can hear you. Nope. Hang on. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay.
Mic check, one, two. Chair, can you hear we can, in the room? We can hear you now. Oh, no. Okay. Madam Chair, are you able to hear me now? I am. Please go ahead. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you so much, and thank you for the patience of the members. Um, can we start with the first slide, Ms. Denny? Ms. Denny, are you able to put the first slide up? We're, we're seeing the slides here. We, we see your oh. slides here. Okay. Can, I don't see it over here. Can we just... So, thank you for your indulgence, members. Uh, my name is Ashish Bala, Executive Director of the Nevada State Infrastructure Bank. Uh, the bank was originally established in 2017 under AB 399. It was subsequently um, provided some more statutory authority in SB 430 in the 2021 session. And I was appointed on September 19, 2022, um, to be the executive director. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Ms. Denny? Thank you. So the bank's mission is to be the boutique lending facility of first choice for innovative special projects in the state of Nevada. Next slide, please. So the bank was really created to address a market need and a market gap for a lending facility for boutique innovative infrastructure projects to transform markets and the lives of residents across the state. The cost of not having this institution is a loss of business, loss of sales, and jobs in the state of Nevada. Nevadans want companies that are in their local communities that invest in jobs in their communities for today and for the markets of tomorrow. And I'd like to specifically say, you know, the bank is really about markets, about the creation of markets, about the sustaining of markets, and about the advancement of markets. Um, we really see jobs as uh, an output of markets that are efficient and effective. And a little bit more on jobs. Nevada has about 1.1 million total workers, but only about 75 million in manufacturing, and around 12.8% of Nevadans live below the federal poverty line. Next slide, please. So the solution is the bank. Close the gap. The bank will make financing available for social and general infrastructure projects at competitive market rates. We'll provide cost savings by reduced expenses for borrowers investing in infrastructure projects in Nevada. Our target clients are Nevada governmental entities, both state and local, uh, Nevada Indian reservations and Indian colonies, and a private non any private nonprofit entities. We aim to make the process efficient and effective with a simple process and interface that gives borrowers financial support they need to build innovative infrastructure projects in Nevada. Next slide. This is a little overview of the types of financing that are available from the bank. Uh, these authorities are laid out in statute in NRS Chapter 408 and uh, include the following. Loan agreements, trust indentures, security agreements, reimbursement agreements, guarantee agreements, bonds or notes, and ordinance or resolutions or similar instruments. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I was supposed to say, yeah, oh, investment policy along the same line, but yes, investment. Uh, <laughs> these slides are a little bit of an overview of our investment policy, and this is our investment objectives. The bank makes decisions based off of three objectives that are our priorities. The first is safety. The safety of the principal is the foremost objective of the investment program. Investments in the bank shall be undertaken to ensure the preservation of capital and the portfolio through the mitigation of credit risk and interest rate risk. The second priority is liquidity. The bank investments will remain sufficiently liquid to enable us to meet all reasonably anticipated cash flow requirements. 
And finally, the bank makes decisions based off of the return on investment. The bank seeks to enhance the financial return consistent with the prudent protection of its investments while conforming to all applicable state statutes governing the investment of these public funds. These are investment objectives that have been laid out in the investment policy approved by the board of the bank. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the three funds that the bank has currently established. The first fund is a charter school capital needs revolving account that has 15 million. The second is an affordable housing revolving account that has 20 million. And the third is a federal infrastructure matching account with 40 million. This last 40 million can also be used um, for the state general infrastructure account at the direction um, and approval of the board. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are some potential transportation type of infrastructure projects that the bank can finance. Some are Title 33, highway construction, Title 49, transit capital projects, um, and also railroad projects. So just a little overview, although the eligible project definition in statute is quite broad. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a review of the goals of the interest rate methodology that have been laid out um, in the interest rate setting methodology by the board of the bank. Um, I won't read all of these, but you can see that there are five um, goals mitigation risk, increasing the attractiveness of loans, allowing for interest rate um, adjustments, ensuring that the viability of the bank in setting interest rates um, appropriately, and then achieving our previous, uh, our previously mentioned goals as well. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the interest rate methodology application. Uh, the bank offers an interest rate based off of an MMD municipal market data index. Um, and after that, the board of directors can uh, apply these seven factors or consider these seven factors and any adjustments that may be necessary um, for the project and in the best interest of the state. Next slide, please. This is a overview of the borrow application process as currently laid out by statute, regulation, and policy. It's currently under review to ensure that we are effectively and efficiently moving funds out the door. Um, however, this really just sort of lays out the specific from intake, from review, to application of the interest rate, to reviewing statutory eligibility, conducting an underwriting process, requiring any other additional information to be provided to the board, um, the board voting to confirm any qualified project and qualified borrowers, the bank authorizing staff to transfer funds and uh, confirm the origination and signing any documents, and then the bank receiving payments from the borrower. Next slide, please. This is just a brief summary of the authorities as laid out in statute um, for the board and for the director to make financing decisions, investment decisions, and uh, procurement and administrative decisions. And uh, next slide, I think that's the end. Yes, and uh, that concludes my presentation, thank you. Thank you very much. And is that, Director, or is that the presentation? Are you finished, or do you have one more? Nope, that is the completion of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I believe we have a question from Senator Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. I have a couple of questions, actually, actually more than that, I think. First off, you didn't mention anything about airports. As a pilot and worries about our security of our airports, our state, I understand that airports are under the authority of NDOT. Is that not? correct? We have very limited authority. We do receive some funding and what we do is we go out and we inspect the air, the smaller airports around the state and it's generally for things like is the runway long enough is a condition of the runway um, in appropriate condition is there fencing around it. We do not do anything with um, McCarran uh, the Harry Reid Airport or the Reno Tahoe Airport. Correct but the director of the airport 
um, I'm not sure whether the title is, I, I know is under NDOT is housed in, in your under you in the office. Is that not correct? Felicia Denny, for the record, uh, I believe you're probably referring to Kurt Haukel. Correct. And yes, he does work for NDOT. Okay. So I, I spoke at their last meeting, and they have one coming up, and I, there's just big concerns over the funding. Um, obviously, they're not very visible e even to you, the new director. And so just wondering that I think there's an important component as we try to get commerce throughout our state and, and maybe look at a, uh, I know a bill's been brought forward to connect to uh, ELCO and some of those fundings. And I would just kind of like to see some more information on um, the interest of NDOT and making sure that that particular department is, is stood up. Um, so obviously you answered that question. And I guess I should have started by saying thank you. Um, I think NDOT um, has done a great job in our local area, I live between. I live in Smith Valley, and so that that flood and that um, rock slide in Wilson Canyon has been huge. And uh, um, got on board immediately and got things moving. And I've been seeing pictures of the rocks and boulders happening. So thank you for what you do do. Um, my next question is regarding the 50 new positions that you're asking for. You said you have a 20% vacancy. Um, and that's 407 people are vacant right now, but yet you want 50 more. So can you tell me what the logist logistics are there when you can't hire the 407, but now you want 50 more? What, what's really going to happen there? Um, Tracy Larkin Thomason, for the record, one of the things, and that's actually one of the things I started to look at on there, one of our highest vacancy rates is in our maintenance area, uh, in the field ones. We did not ask for any positions in there. What primary positions are like in IT, I believe that was 14 of them. There's some admin support. Um, I, I'm afraid I can't go in much deeper on that right now, uh, but happy to provide you more information on the specifics. Right. But, it, but the highest vacancy rate is in maintenance and construction out in the field, but those were ones we did not ask for replacement on. Okay, great, because having uh, traveling through here in Smith Valley all the time and knowing that there's a dearth of snowplow drivers, and I know up in my uh, senator uh, in mid-central uh, Nevada, there's, it's sometimes hard to get those, but thank you for those that are working and getting that done. And one more question, if I might, Madam Chair. Yes, one more. Thank you. Um, so Highway 11, you didn't mention that. It's been, um, I'd love to see an update. Um, I've gotten brochures in the past on the plans of Highway 11. Just would love to hear an update on where that project is, how far in the planning are you, um, and just what has actually been done trying to connect both ends of our state. Absolutely. We can provide you a more in-depth one. There is part of the Henderson project that's going through. will be part of kind of on the south end of uh, Las Vegas. will be part of the I-11. And then we, of course, are looking at as we move up the 95 corridor, which has been designated as part of the future I-11. Um, there's still, a, it, it's a slow moving thing. We're also working with our partners in Arizona and we have been, um, I'm behind a few years on asking, asking what their projects are, but the new, um, their new director, Jennifer Toth, actually was the planning director that I was working with when we initiated I-11 study back in there. Great. So you have a historical knowledge of that. It's just that, I, you know, I represent six different rural counties. That, that highway is a big question to them. Which towns is it going to skip? What town will it go through? And so it's something that uh, people at my constituents ask me about. Um, not infrequently. So thank you for all of that. Thank, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you, Director, and um, everyone else that helped with the presentation. I just had a quick question on slide. It's not numbered, but it's about the fueling system upgrade. I was just curious. I noticed that you, you had indicated that there needed to be um, improvements to the um, the, because I guess there were um, the E85 and biodiesel vehicles. The yard, I'm assuming that's what's providing, the location that provides the fueling is out of compliance. So my question was, um, I was just curious where that was located in the Las Vegas area. And then also, do we have like fleets and equipment that we're still using that are utilizing these alternative fueling systems? Yes to the last one. We still have um, one in the fleet. The main part is in the Washington Yard that's off of Washington Street. It's a main maintenance station in Las Vegas. Um, it's more deficient than it is. Um, I, 
the, than the word that you used, I'm sorry. Um, it needs to be brought up to date. Oftentimes the pumps are not working, they're failing. Um, and that is the primary area where we get um, the fuel for the majority of the maintenance workers. We also have fueling stations at the South Yard, which is next to FAST. So we do have an alternatives there. Um, most of the alternate fuel like E85 is actually off site now. So part of the upgrades looking at it will be bringing some on site because it's really inefficient if you have to drive a fair distance to fuel up and come back. Um, but it, like I said, it's it's more that it's deficient than that it, than it's un, um, that it's out of compliance. Thank you very much, uh, Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple questions to understand the process. The um, the infrastructure bank comes under the Department of um, Transportation. Is that because it's viewed that many of the projects will be transportation projects? Because because the infrastructure bank isn't just restricted to transportation projects, correct? Uh, in truth, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, down in Las Vegas. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, to the uh, chair through the assemblywoman, uh, Ashish Bala, executive director for the record. Yes, um, I just mentioned some of the transportation projects. The bank is in the Department of Transportation pursuant to statute and regulation. However, the definition of eligible projects in statute is much broader um, beyond just transportation projects. Thank you. Can I have one more question? Yes. Is any of the funding that goes into the infrastructure bank, is any of that from the treasurer's office as an investment for them? The state treasurer's office. The state treasurer's office. So the current funding, the $75 million allocated to the bank, was provided from a bond sale that was done by the treasurer's office, mm -hmm. and that money still sits in the general fund. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblyman Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to the issue on position vacancies, uh, I believe, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I think you mentioned that in certain positions, in certain areas, there's up to a 42% pay discrepancy. Um, but I, you know, and I see that there's the proposed addition of, of many new positions and you provided some of the background on the extremely high vacancy rates. So I guess um, the, one of the questions I have is, do so it seems with no other enhancements like step increases or other things, there all, there's the proposed 8% and 4% uh, for, for state employees. So how is that going to address a 42% pay discrepancy? And are we going to be able to to reduce, uh, sufficiently reduce vacancies and, and recruit for those new positions that are being added. Uh, Director Tracy Larkin, for the record, I honestly don't know. And simply for the fact that it is definitely a step in the right direction and it is more than they have seen in quite some time. But what we're also seeing around the state is also in like some of the rural areas because mining is going up. Um, they are actually buying out the housing. So what we're finding is what was before affordable housing in more of the rural areas, like in Austin and in Elko and some of the others, they can no longer afford to buy houses there. Um, so that's kind of just acerbates the, the situation. Um, in many areas, you know, many of them have lived in around the state. They've been in the area. Some of them, and, and God bless them, I will have to tell you that my field personnel are incredible. And I... I thank um, Assemblywoman um, Titus for her comment before because when there is emergencies, they absolutely shine. Um, I'm hoping that it will help at least stave off and help it to settle down. But we are looking at a lot where our topped out part is actually at the bottom of the adjacent agencies. So after spending basically 10 years, they are now just reach the beginning step at another agency. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I, I know you also talked about uh, inflation, uh, the, the impacts of inflation on the agency. You know, it looks like uh, 
kind of the the net budget change over the biennium is going to be seventeen uh, percent uh, or so, and that includes the influx of federal funds. Um, I think it includes a decrease in the highway fund, even though highway uh, fund revenues are actually projected to increase because I think of the proposed um, tax holiday. And from Q1 2021 to 2022, uh, highway construction inflation was 20% higher. So it seems like at the end of the day, where we're heading is not even going to catch up with with inflation. And I know there's been a lot of conversations around uh, highway funding. Um, but I guess, again, looking, I guess, stepping out a little bit from just the staffing issues to some of the projects, um, it sounds like even with the influx in federal funds, we're going to be maybe holding steady, maybe a tiny bit back from where we'd like to be between the impacts of inflation and the the budget that is presented before us. Is that That is a correct accurate? statement. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Assemblywoman Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, you've probably heard me grumbling earlier. I, I graduated in two, from college in 2011 with a class of um, brilliant civil engineers, and many of them ended up at um, NDOT but didn't last very long. The turnover at NDOT has historically been really fast, um, often less than two years. And the positions that these young engineers are put in is a little overwhelming in some cases. Um, so it's not just about recruitment and retention, it's also about morale and our ability to meet these young engineers where they're at and get them the training that they need to be able to get the PEs that um, get them to stay in the, the higher end positions that we really need for design and, um, and functionality of your department. That was my soapbox. But my question has to do with um, your statement earlier about the dozers um, and how purchasing dozers is cheaper than renting dozers, but it's not clear in my documentation whether that includes the maintenance and operation costs of those as well, which is often included in those rental rates, and whether that was considered in your um, determination that it was cheaper for the state to purchase them and own them than to just rent them. Yes, it was considered. Um, sorry, Tracy Larkin for the record. Um, yes, that was considered in there. We do. Um, there's usually a fairly detailed look at what the operations and maintenance is, and then also even the mobilization, but where we can get them, where they're located uh, over the lifetime. A loader is expected to last about 20 years. Um, the payback on there, if you're using that 720K I was looking at, is about nine years. May I have a follow up real quick? Um, does do you already have um, a flatbed to transport these on? Because for yes. one, for the whole state, okay. Um, do you have more than one in case you need to move both of these pieces of equipment across the state? There is more than one flatbed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question has to do with the slide that had to do with um, the major projects. <laughs> pretty early on and, and it almost was kind of a comment about uh, almost a throwaway. Um, I'm the granddaughter of a railroader, so I'm always interested in the railroads. Um, you mentioned that the railroad funding, I guess, upkeep or changes is elsewhere, but the oversight is based upon NDOT. Uh, can you go into that a little bit more, number one, but then number two as well? I know that nationally there's a large amount of infrastructure, uh, especially with how much more active the rail, railroad is becoming. Um, do we have the staff that can handle this oversight with how many both used railroads and then also empty or unused rail railways there are in our state? Uh, Tracy Larkin for the record. Um, I'm gonna start with the first one if we're talking about Brightline specifically, and I'm sure that somewhere along the line you'll have a presentation on that. Um, we are the entity that the funding needs to flow through. So that's how we're actually providing the oversight. Where there is part of the funding, part of the requirements on Brightline is an independent third party to actually do the oversight uh, because we do not have real experts within our department. Um, I apologize, what was the other question? 
of the future possible and thank you for that clarification of the future possible infrastructure changes that are being discussed at the national level uh, with the federal rail changes that are happening I think right now they're still working their way through all the different areas at the federal level so I don't know if funding is there yet just curious as to whether or not that would also again be oversight outside of our state um, agency or if there is in fact staffing that could continue to do that oversight as I understand it right now, most of it we do, like I said, we have a third party, so there is funding that's going in, not highway funding, it's not NDOT funding, it is outside funding that is, so we can independently see it over there. Now, there are portions of the Bright Line project that are highway projects that we will be overseeing, such as emergency crossovers over the I-15, so that as most of the alignment is down the center line, uh, as you get towards the California border, um, so we will be overseeing that ourselves because that is something that ultimately we will be maintaining, but that's traditional infrastructure. Um, we are working, and I, I do say we have a great project manager, and we've been working extremely closely with the California side also to ensure that as we look at different um, agreements and things like that, that we're steady, and uh, f quite frankly, Caltrans, um, CalStyle has much more uh, experience with the rail. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Senator Gansard. Um, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I have a question about the Aerial A75 underbridge inspection truck. Is that a, a maintenance overhaul, or is that a new truck? And do you use drones to inspect underbridges as well, or, or what, what other technologies do you use? I almost want to say yes, yes, and yes. Um, Tracy Larkin, for the record, it is a new truck coming in. The existing one is going under a major overhaul. It is 10 years old. And yes, we do use drones, particularly like on the, the bridge between Arizona and Nevada. But a lot of them, like the Truckee River Bridge, where you particularly have very high um, clearance from the, the ground. Thank, thank you. And then my other questions are around the infrastructure bank. And originally when that, uh, it was created, I think in 17, and then, did, anyway, okay, so it was created in 17, and then I, I thought there were ARPA dollars that were gonna be used to fund that or a portion of that, and but it looks like um, our treasurer issued bonds in April maybe of 22. Yeah. Madam Chair, through the Senator Ashish Bala, Executive Director, for the record, that's correct, um, Madam Senator. Um, there are no other uh, funds that have been received by the bank so far. The bank does have broad latitude in statute to receive private funds, public funds from the legislature, from the federal government. However, at this time, the bank has uh, just the $75 million proceeds from the bond sale. Okay, and then have any of those proceeds been lent out to date? Have any of them been, been used? They have not. Okay, so we, it sounds like we borrowed to be able to fund the bank and then we haven't really loaned any money out yet. Um, and then my other question is, we've had funds over the years from the federal government or from different sources that have been used as leverage to um, allow someone to go through a traditional bank, traditional bank that it's helped for leverage purposes. So we may put a million dollars or $2 million to support a project as far as their leverage that they need to be able to get a loan. But in this case, it sounds like we're doing the underwriting and the loaning and everything. So I just wanna understand that choice better versus going with a model where we use a traditional bank, but uh, because they have resources and it's highly regulated versus doing the banking ourselves. So, you know, the bank has, you know, an underwriting process that has been laid out in regulation and, um, you know, so the bank staff have to conduct a credit analysis and a review of income streams. The bank also has pretty broad latitude regarding financing agreements, so guarantees are an instrument that can be used in order to leverage these funds from outside. Um, so there, there is a process for the bank to um, allow borrowers to use funds um, in order to leverage other sources. So that is one option, but borrowers have an array of options that they could request from the bank. Thank you. And last question, when do you expect to be loaning, making loans or, or going through the process to be able to, to use the funds for which we've already bonded? Sure. Uh, 
to the chair through the senator, uh, Shish Bala, for the record. I would like to get that done as soon as possible. Unfortunately, I'm one staffer right now, and I'm trying to stand up an underwriting, origination, and servicing um, process. And so we are establishing our policies and procedures for that. And um, as soon as possible, the board can meet, and we can issue funds. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to go back to the um, capital improvement projects that you had listed. And I realize finance plays an important role when making the decisions, but what is the process of prioritizing these um, projects? What's the timeline look like? And how does your vacancy rate affect those projects and timelines? Thank you for the question. Uh, for the record, Darren Tedford, Deputy Director for Project Delivery. Uh, we have a detailed process for incorporating all the goals of the state, including preserving infrastructure, addressing safety primarily, connecting communities. There are six goals in our One Nevada Transportation Plan. We put all of the projects, big and small, through that process, and then uh, we come up with a prioritized list of projects. We use that uh, funding amount that was discussed, what we have per year, and determine how many projects we can do. And uh, it also takes into account which projects are ready. Uh, smaller projects might be ready faster than larger projects. So that's taken into account. We develop a short range plan that's typically four years. And then we have a long range plan also to anticipate some of the projects that you see on the slide, for example, will be longer range projects and we're anticipating into the future how long uh, and when those will be ready and when they can be delivered. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So <laughs> I had two questions. Yeah, I know. I, so I, I saw in your, um, one of your slides, it doesn't have the page, but it had your actual um, personnel. You're doing two additional civil rights personnel. And so I'm super curious as to the, the need and the work that is currently being engaged in. Um, you've now, Director Larkin, you've been a part of the agency for a really, really long time. But in terms of DBE, you guys have struggled for over 20 years as an agency. The most recent disparity study, which was 2013, and I believe, I don't know if there's a more recent one, that's, um, you're still less than 1% or around 1%. It's, the study continues to say that even when you do gender neutral, race neutral goals, you still fall short of meeting participation. So it's in professional services, it's in local contracting. And so what have we done in order to move the needle forward in the, in the neutral policies that you guys have adopted to try to engage? Because it's, it's pretty consistent that it's still the same conversation, that even when you do the charrettes, the round table, folks come with their certification, they come with some criteria to meet, they're still ineligible. And so I would like you to address that. Thank you again, Tracy Larkin Thomas, and for the record. Um, you referenced 2013. I, I was, as you mentioned, I was very heavily involved in working with the civil rights program during my former positions in the state, particularly in Southern Nevada. There is, um, there was a considerable amount of progress made about from 2015, about the time we started with, I would say as we got into NEON, we had worked towards actually getting a resource center established in Las Vegas. Now, I have not yet gone back to establish where things are yet today, so I will double check on that, but we were actually providing a service where people could go in, determine what was the best way for them depending on what kind of work they were doing with the department if they were a dbe how to go through the process of being a dbe if it was a wbe or an mbe um, also we were providing um, 
legal services and accounting services to help them get started as a business. One of the things is often while they're very good at their trade, they're not always well established on the business side. So we were also looking at expanding that into northern Nevada, uh, but our primary focus was in southern Nevada. I, I honestly don't know the numbers right now. I can, I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Um, Sonny Bray, who is our civil rights um, executive, has actually done extremely well in working with a lot of particularly um, the chambers um, down in Vegas. And then we have some people in the north that are looking out throughout the state to actually see if we can call and develop and actually reach out and see where we can help them move forward. So I don't, I can't completely answer your question question right now, but I will be happy to explore this farther with you. Thank you. Quick follow-up, Madam Chair. So in the capacity building um, that is being, that the current civil rights person is engaging in, have you guys actually adopted bundling in order to build capacity? I know that the one of the prior civil rights persons who was there um, it was an African-American female attorney who left within two years, had proposed what Illinois had been doing, which was bundling in order to build capacity for your micro business or your smaller businesses so that they can start to get a foot in the economic opportunities that are there and benefit from the taxpayer revenue that all persons are paying. And so have you guys adopted the bundling? To my knowledge at this time, that has not been adopted. Again, I can't explain for the last few years. I do remember looking at it in the past, and there were some challenges even with some of the existing um, personnel. We do work very hard, uh, particularly on bonding and things like that, to make sure that when people are bringing into the job, if they reach their bond limit, that we work with the contractors to make sure that once their bond limit has expired, that can basically it starts over. So we kind of partition it off so they can continue to work on larger projects. But specifically on bundling, I do not have an answer for that today. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director, for your presentation. Um, I have a question relative to some of the background information that we were provided. Um, there are a number of projects under capital expenditures that appear to be already underway. And so I'm curious to know, they were funded then previously, and, and I'll just call out um, probably Dropicana, right, Interstate 15, which should be underway right now. Um, and so I just want Clarification, a number of the projects, Henderson Interchange Improvement, the Drop a Canopies, Phase 1B of the Highway 395 North Valley's project, those are already funded and underway. Is that correct? For the record, Darren Tedford, Deputy Director, thank you for the question. Uh, the Drop a Canna project is underway, and the, there will be additional funding that is spent during this coming biennium on that project. The Henderson project has not begun yet. That's going to be a, a overhaul of the whole Henderson interchange as a design build project. We're just getting the consultant on board to help us with the with that project. And then phase 1B of the North Valley's widening is actually uh, what's going to advertise later this year. And that project, the phase 1A was replacing the power structure. And so phase 1B will be from McCarran or roughly Clear Acre up to Golden Valley. Thank you. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Just and just one more piece. First, I have to. Um, I would be remiss if I did not call out the great efforts of your public information officer, in particular relative to the activities around Dropicana right now, which is a very interesting and unique project. To that end, though, many of these projects are not specifically just Department of Transportation, it's not just DOT. You're doing collaborative efforts in all of these areas with the local municipalities, is that also correct? Uh, Darren Tedford for the record, uh, yes, absolutely, that's correct. When uh, we have a project that touches on one or more local agencies on the RTCs, we're always in coordination to make sure we're getting the best project possible. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Senator Gia. I, I didn't, didn't hear you. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, Apologies. Anyway, I'm going to get back to the maintenance side, side of it. And uh, 
It looks like you're doing a little better, uh, Director, in seasonal position vacancies. Have you explored going back to critical or essential positions where we can actually bring retirees on in in a seasonal capacity, much like we're doing for school teachers? If it's, uh, I, I believe, you know, especially some of these areas, whether it's snow removal or even chip seals or whatever in the summer, you've, we've got some people that have retired uh, and are drawing benefits, whether it be from local government or the state, but have the job skills. Can you do that? Can you use that slot, essential or critical? Do we need to designate that? And it's whether it's your department, whether it's corrections, if we've got people that have the capability and work seasonal or temporarily, short term. Tracy Larkin for the, the record. Um, I'm smiling a little bit because I just had to go through that paperwork in the past week. Yes, we absolutely can. There is a process in place to put forward. It, has, it does require some approvals, but we put forward what the need is and why and where. Yeah, it, it clearly there are people out there that can do it, don't want to work for the mines, take a shorter shift for the state. One more question, if I may, Madam Chair. And the three rest stops you're doing at Trinity, Larkin, and Miller, or Biwawi and Miller, uh, are, are you going to do those through the winter months, or clearly you get your heavy load in the summertime on those uh, when are you going to try and do the retrofit? Are you going to do one line, one side at a time, or one stall at a time? Well, we are going through a phased approach. I, I, I do not know the specifics to the the construction plans. Um, I do know that uh, Trinity still has some challenges that we're working through. So I know it'll be the third one in the row. But Bowawi and uh, Miller will be moving forward earlier. Um, as you know, Trinity has some issues with water. Uh, quality and so on. But again, as I mentioned before, it is one of the, the, the top used ones in the state. It is the top uh, most frequented place in the state. All right. Yes, I understand that. But again, you know, whether if you're in Biwawi and it's closed, it becomes problematic for some people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the committee? I think I got everybody. Thank you so much for your time today and what you do. And, uh, we all learned a few things. And thank you as you remove snow for all of us from down south. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we will transition to the Department of Corrections. And we have uh, Director Zarenda and his team. Welcome back, Dr Director, good to see you. Welcome back to the Silver State and uh, Go ahead when you're ready. Welcome. How are you? We're glad to see you. All right, please go ahead when you're ready. Well, first, I couldn't be more happier to be here in front of you. 
Um, James Arenda for the record. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair Dundero Loop and members of the Legislative Commission's Budget Subcommittee. My name is James Arenda. I'm the director of the Nevada Department of Corrections and McCann working in this capacity on January 9th, 2023. I am new to this position with this administration, but not new to working for the Department of Corrections. I'm excited to be back in this great state of Nevada and to continue where I left off and bring in the best practices and my long career experience and leadership in the correctional systems nationally. It's important for me to develop a correctional system and culture that promotes not only professionalism, but for, for support, education, respectful treatment of every individual under my care. For those who, who know me, have seen how passionate I am with creating the right culture and understanding the powerful impacts the Department of Corrections will make on every individual in its care. You will all see my passion to lead change, to create a safer community for our families and our friends. As you know, just under 90% of everyone in our care will be released back into the community between now and the next two decades. This is why we all need to understand that the way we treat offenders, the way we provide services to the offenders, and the way we provide evidence-based programs to the offenders, as well as the way we provide each offender with tools, support, and services the second they enter our correctional system and continue upon release has an impact on our own families. I am dedicated to moving the department forward and instilling staff the vital importance of our jobs, which is to do the best we can to be positive role models, which many of them that are incarcerated have never had, so that our family, friends, and communities will not become the next victims. I want to do this by operating a fiscally sound, transparent, and effective operation in our correctional system. Here is a brief overview of what I will present during our time together, leaving room for questions from the subcommittee at the end of the presentations. However, if you do have any questions during the pleasant presentation, please do just interrupt me as I, before I proceed to the next slide. The mission, the mission of the Nevada Department of Corrections will be improve public safety by ensuring a safe and humane environment that incorporates proven rehabilitation initiatives that prepare individuals for successful reentry or reintegration into our communities. We must all work together as an agency, as legislature, and as a community to provide all these opportunities, tools, and 